Um, welcome to the additional public hearing for the Inquiry into Budget Estimates 2021-2022. Before I commence, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional, traditional custodians on the lands on which we're meeting today. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, um, and um, celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to any Aboriginal um, or Torres Strait Islander people joining today and also any who may be uh, watching um, the live stream. Uh, so I welcome officials from Transport for New South Wales to this hearing. Before we commence, I'd like to make some brief comments about the procedures for today's hearing. Today's proceedings are being broadcast live. Uh, from Parliament's website and a transcript will be placed on the committee's website once it becomes available. In accordance with the broadcasting guidelines, media representatives are reminded that they must take responsibility for what they publish about the committee's proceedings. All witnesses in budget estimates have a right to procedural fairness according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the House in 2018. There may be some questions that a witness can only answer if they have more time or with certain documents to hand. Uh, in these circumstances, and these circumstances only, witnesses are advised that they can take a question on notice and provide an answer by 17th of June 2022. And I will note that that may be um, a fewer number of days than what we have uh, normally um, put forward as the 21 days, but uh, yes, so 17th of June. Um, finally, could everyone please turn their mobile phones to silent for the duration of the hearing? All witnesses will be sworn prior to giving evidence. Um, but I'd like to remind the following witnesses that you do not need to be sworn as you have been sworn at an earlier budget estimates uh, hearing before this committee uh, and that is Mr. Shah, Mr. Longland, Mr. Collins, Mr. Merrick and Mr. Olloway. Um, and for our other witness, Ms. Taylor, um, I would now ask that you state your full name, position, title and agency and then swear either the oath or the affirmation. Thank you. My name is Tracy Taylor. I am the Chief People Officer for Transport for New South Wales. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Um, so today's hearing will be conducted from 9.30 to 12pm, during which there will be questions from the opposition and crossbench members only. Uh, if required, an additional 15 minutes is allocated at the end of the session for government questions. Um, thank you very much for your attendance today, uh, and we will begin with questions from the opposition. Mr. Graham. Great. Thank you, Chair. Uh, welcome back to the officials. Uh, as the Chair's indicated, there's essentially one day left when um, budget estimates might be conducted, um, so I can guarantee this is the last appearance in, uh, in this cycle. Are you sure you want to do that? Are you sure? Because <laughs> but essentially the reason we're here um, is because of what have been significant public disagreements between ministers in the government about the state of the rail negotiations. That's essentially the most important reason why this hearing's been reconvened. Um, so I want to turn to that firstly, uh, Mr Sharp. Uh, so I mean, there have been two very different views put about the fate of rail services in New South Wales, about whether this is this situation's about to be fixed, the view of one minister, Minister Elliott, or whether there's a line in the sand here the view of Ministers Tudor, Hope and Keane, that should not be crossed, uh, and this is far from settled. So essentially my first question to you and the officials with you is, um, who is right? Where is this, where is this dispute up to? Uh, the premise of your question is, uh, who makes the decisions uh, in, in many respects there? Uh, there will be differing views around the table in regards to any industrial relations uh, matter. The process that we have in place uh, is that we are negotiating uh, directly with the unions. Uh, so the team around here are the key players uh, with the direct involvement. We keep uh, each of the ministers and the various portfolio ministers across uh, the detail of that. So uh, Minister Elliott is the portfolio minister. He has the direct accountability. Uh, he's been intimately involved uh, with the process uh, since he came into the portfolio and we clearly uh, brief him in detail. Uh, you might remember a Premier's uh, memorandum that came out in March, uh, which articulated the role uh, of uh, Minister Tudorhope. Uh, that articulated that his uh, involvement would be looking at it from a whole of government perspective. So a strategic role, uh, my words, a strategic role looking across whole of government. 
uh, and uh, his views would take into account uh, the broader aspects of the industrial relations. Uh, so joint accountability was the words the Premier used in terms of uh, those two ministers. Uh, as you're aware, any uh, item that impacts the budget, and clearly uh, wages policy is one of those, uh, Treasury has uh, detailed, uh, hands-on uh, detailed requirements around that. So for any papers we put up, are we complying with wages policy? If we're not, uh, what are savings and other things that we're using to offset uh, those propositions? So the Treasurer has a keen interest in this, uh, clearly because there are costs involved. Uh, it's been a substantial uh, negotiation over almost 12 months now. And Not just an interest, but a decision-making role, is that what uh, you're saying? The, yes, the treasure, Treasury has, has a decision-making role and a recommendation. So what yeah. they would and do the is treasurer, recommend... Just turning to the Treasurer. The Treasurer would... Uh, make decision-making role. Order, he, point he, of order, he, Chair. Um, Mr Sharp's trying to provide uh, an answer, and Mr Graham keeps um, uh, seeking clarifications while the answer is happening. I would suggest that it's probably better that Mr Sharp conclude his answer before Mr Graham seek any elucidations, not only for clarity, but also for the benefit of answer. Thank you. Um, although it is true that we should um, obviously be sticking to a, a question-answer format, in this particular instance, I do think it was more conversational and, and helpful. Um, I don't think the line's been crossed as yet, uh, but continue, please, Mr Graham. Mr Sharp. I was, just, I was just simply asking, you referred to the Treasurer's role, I was simply asking the Treasurer not only has an interest, your words, but has a decision-making role. That's the question. Yeah, his decision-making role is uh, what recommendation he puts to Cabinet. So yeah. ultimately the decision-makers yeah. are the Cabinet. Yeah. And uh, as I said at the beginning, you will have differing views. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's different risk profiles, there's yeah. different cost profiles depending yeah. on uh, a number of options. Yeah. So from transport's perspective, what we're doing is uh, negotiating uh, an outcome that we believe uh, could be acceptable with the union movement and straddles those lines that we need to cover in terms of yeah. policy positions, etc. Uh, that will go to Cabinet shortly yeah. and uh, will be considered at Cabinet. Uh, each of the Cabinet members will obviously have, a, yeah, have their sure. own views and uh, their own department recommendations. Mm -hmm. and, and in, the Cabinet and Premier will consider those and, and make a decision. And as we sit here today, how shortly do you expect that to go to Cabinet? It's imminent. Yeah, and when you say it's imminent, give us some sense. Give the uh, the, the, Sydney the Cabinet sense. submissions are in final form and uh, there's regular uh, ERC meetings happening. There's about two or three of them a week at the moment through the budget process. Mm -hmm. uh, as soon as there's approval for the final version of that Cabinet submission, uh, will be in there presenting to Cabinet. Yeah, so that sounds like, like it's perhaps a week away, perhaps two uh, weeks away. I would away. say uh, within a week, maybe two at the maximum. We're, we're right down to the uh, pointy end of decision being required. Yes, and just, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but just so we're clear on who is actually dealing with this in the Government, of the Ministers. What are the role, I might ask you about a couple of other individuals, what is the role of Minister Faraway? How would you describe his role? Yeah, so Minister Faraway uh, is kept abreast of all the industrial relations items that affect uh, the regional uh, fleet uh, in particular. Uh, so I, I describe his role as a, a support role to the portfolio minister. Uh, so we keep him abreast uh, regularly. Yeah, uh, but he's not in the negotiations. He's not in the separate negotiations. To those. Right. So the two, Who is in the negotiations? The uh, two ministers that the Premier has asked to be jointly accountable, yeah. uh, which is Minister Allard as the portfolio lead, yeah. and Minister Tudor Hope representing the government from an industrial relations perspective. And a separate individual, uh, a question about their role, what role is the Premier playing? How would you describe that role? Uh, the Premier is uh, certainly interested in uh, the negotiations uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, there's uh, uh, potential impacts uh, for customers uh, it's been a protracted negotiation uh, and there are potential ramifications for whole of government. So mm. clearly the Premier would have an interest. Mm. Uh, however, uh, he's very much keeping uh, the process uh, at arm's length. So mm. we're, we're still working through the processes we would normally work through in briefing mm. a number mm. of um, players. Right, OK. And that, I mean, and that my specific CPC. question is about what is the Premier's former role in this? Of course he's got an interest. Commuters have an interest. Yeah. The Premier's got an interest. But you're saying he's not... His, his formal role is as a member of the uh, Cabinet and ultimately uh, you know, the Chair of the Cabinet. So 
that's that's his role. Uh, these decisions would be a cabinet decision. Yeah, and and you would. I, I, I'm just. You may not have been uh, present at the time, but you'd acknowledge that is different to the role, for example, the former premier played at times in these negotiations with transport officials. In fact, quite a hands-on role. Yes, I, I'm aware of uh, some of the commentary around that. Uh, however, uh, I wasn't here at the yeah. time. Uh, all I can talk to is the process that's been agreed in this particular circumstance. Mm. OK. And return, so thanks for that rundown. I just want to return to that central question, though. Uh, Minister Elliott says this is close to agreement. Uh, two other ministers on the 12th of May stood up and said there's a line in the sand here we will not cross, uh, clearly indicating this could be a major dispute. Give us some guidance, these two very different views about where mm. this is up to. What is the view of senior transport officials about whether this is close to agreement or at risk of being derailed for quite some time? Uh, if, if I wind the clock back about three months, uh, we were coming off the back of uh, about six months of uh, pretty uh, hard negotiations and industrial protected industrial action. Uh, there was an agreement reached with the unions, uh, and uh, Minister Elliott was uh, very much part of that process, which was to actually get together uh, and kick off a detailed intensive bargaining process uh, where we would commit full resources and the uh, unions, and there's a number of unions, about seven or eight unions, uh, would do likewise. Uh, that, that then uh, actually formed a, a governance structure for transport because it enabled us to have the debates around the 300 claims that were on the table at the time and actually try and distill those down to what were the core claims that the members are really after. Uh, we needed to also fully understand the cost implications and we also needed to land a consensus, if you like, around what might be a solution for the Marion plan. So just breaking those out, uh, the enterprise agreements uh, where we've reached is an agreed position with the unions that we would table to Cabinet for their consideration a number of enterprise agreement claims. Now what that means is we're presenting a package yep. that the unions are comfortable with and we've committed uh, with the unions that we would put that package up for, for consideration. Yep. The Marion is, uh, sorry just before I go on, uh, so I uh, mentioned earlier about Treasury's involvement. So yep. we've been working closely with Treasury on the wages policy uh, considerations of those. And uh, so some claims, for example, uh, would set a precedent uh, across whole of government. Mm. So clearly there would be views uh, from Minister Chuhok in terms of whether uh, that broader ramification flowing right across whole of government, whether that would be an acceptable position or not. Mm. Uh, I'm assuming that those, uh, those types of items would be debated and covered off in recommendations made at Cabinet uh, by Minister Tudor Hope and DPC. In terms of the Marion, uh, we're talking about a four-year journey uh, in, in regards to the Marion fleet. Uh, there's three or four different options in terms of how that may be uh, concluded. Those options are articulated in the Cabinet submission. Uh, Minister Elliott's comments, uh, my personal view, were relating to that process I've articulated where we had the weekly meetings. Uh, Minister Tudor Hope and uh, Minister Elliott and myself attended each week uh, as an escalation point and decision making point. It did help move uh, decisions along. In terms of the Marion fleet, uh, there's a, an operating model uh, question that's uh, clearly been on the union's minds and members for some time. Yeah. So about August, September last year, I started to asked the question as to whether there were either uh, options that were sort of intermediate, in other words, sort of in between the two positions, yeah. and uh, there had been commitments by the government uh, memorandum back in 2019 in regards to keeping guards on the trains. Mm. So the debate was really around what was the role of a guard mm. and how did that operate in practice, yeah. and could it operate safely. So Mr Sharp, without so going into all of the history, I think that has been yeah. very helpful, but give us some sense. Um, of what are the possible uh, choices here uh, that the agencies face? What are the possible options? Well, the, the Cabinet papers are in confidence. Yes, um, no, yeah, and, but, I, I, and I obviously I can't that. talk yeah. to all the uh, specific options. Yeah. Uh, but uh, suffice to say, there are options, yeah. and there's a spectrum. Uh, yeah. you know, the spectrum is 
uh, that this doesn't agree with wages policy, mm. uh, so therefore elements of it wouldn't be approved, mm. or the savings, there's a, a package here that is acceptable to the government and mm. also uh, meets the union needs. So I think on the enterprise agreement elements, yeah. uh, we're reasonably close. There's yeah. been a lot of work done, and uh, I do actually thank uh, all the participants around this table as well as the senior union leaders, uh, because it has been a very productive mm. uh, seven-week uh, process. Mm. Uh, the sticking point is yeah. the Marion, yeah. and uh, and obviously there would be costs associated with uh, with any options that get put forward. Yeah. Uh, so we have been uh, looking at the market to say, well, what would those costs be if we went down scenario one, scenario two, scenario three? What yeah. are those various costs? Yeah, uh, it's been public uh, speculation, and that's yeah. a billion dollars. Um, well, I can't, the, can't the, talk to public speculation in terms of numbers, but clearly there is well, an well, increase I'm, in I'm, uh, cost. Going to, I'm going to put this, let me just put the question to you, because um, ministers are in public talking about these costs, so I do think it's fair to ask the agency to give the parliament some guidance. One view put by ministers very strongly is that this is a billion dollars. Another view put by Minister Elliott is it will be less. Um, that is, the, I mean, this is the debate that commuters are listening to us, they catch the train, uh, give us some sense of what the agency's view on that, given ministers are commenting so freely. So uh, costs are driven by a number of items. Uh, there's the actual physical cost to a train, where uh, under options we might decide to move controls or uh, screens, TV screens for example. Uh, so there's direct costs. Then there's uh, a number of other costs which are for example, prolongation costs. Mm. So it's just a fancy word for saying the program's going to run longer mm. and uh, there will be contractual penalties and contractual costs. So the suppliers would have a have to keep their team on for six months, 12 months, 18 months, whatever the uh, particular option is. So prolongation is one of the key cost drivers. Uh, the actual physical costs of something we've been working on with the unions and suppliers. Mm. Uh, we have uh, landed a position on that and that's in the cabinet paper. Mm. Uh, it's nowhere near a billion dollars. Mm. Uh, there's also quite a few costs. Uh, clearly we've got trains now, 26 train sets that have arrived. Uh, 10 are being stored up at Kangiangi. We've got 16 uh, around various yards. That I'd comes with storage costs. Yeah, so, so, I just, so you add all those right. up and you, and you come up with a number of uh, a number of cost scenarios. So which which of those is I just want to come to some of those specific costs. Which of those is bigger, the direct costs of fixing these carriages, uh, possibly for safety issues, or the delay? Which of those numbers is bigger? Uh, the actual physical costs are much much lower. Uh, so it's much, much the, lower. It's, it's lower than a billion dollars. Yeah, which is the headline number you were talking about. Yeah. But so there's, in terms two, of the there's two portion, issues here, fixing the carriages or the cost of delay, as these this issues just delay out, is much which of those significant. is bigger? The cost of delay, contractual implications, commitments under the contracts is much bigger than the actual cost of changes to the train sets themselves. Yeah. So if you're talking about proportions, uh, the, the prolongation costs are a key cost driver. Yeah. So all this uh, disputation, all this carrying on, is actually adding to the cost more than the cost of actually getting on and fixing those carriages. Is that yes, look, uh, any, uh, any contract with a supplier to uh, run and maintain uh, a train, when it gets to a point of implementation and they should be operating those trains, mm. there would be contractual uh, costs that arise and mm. we're at that point. Mm. So that point was arrived, I think it was in, in April uh, this year, yeah. and uh, it grows over time. So it starts at a smaller amount, but yeah. obviously the longer the period that the, the contractor would want compensation. And that, that's a contractual element that was in the contracts from about four years ago. And I'll put to you some of the specific costs that have been referred to in public. Uh, those direct costs might be, and, and I'll just ask you to confirm this or not, those direct costs might be $385 million. The costs of delay might be $420 of those. $420 million of those costs accurate? Uh, it's not appropriate for me to talk to specific costs, uh, firstly because they've still been worked on, uh, secondly uh, those costs are going up to Cabinet and there's a mixture of costs and a mixture of options. So if, if I comment on a specific cost, I'd have to comment on a whole bunch of contextual matters and which option we're talking about. Well let so, me ask you so about a very narrow specific cost there, it's, uh, one, again, it's one that... Um, Mr Sharp, 
was trying to... Is this a point of yes, order? Yes, it's a point of order. Well, if you could indicate that. Well, maybe if you don't talk over the witness, it would be... Uh, okay, not order. I think I, order. I understand what the point of order is going to be. Um, in that case, there was a bit of um, talking over, which it does make it hard for Hampshire. Um, please proceed, Mr Brown. I'll just ask you, Mr Shuff, about one specific cost. Again, this is a cost that ministers are quoting freely. The cost of storage... Um, uh, was talked about as $30 million a month. Is that cost accurate? Uh, no. Uh, the cost is uh, just under a $1 million a month for storage. Uh, there are substantial other costs, however. Uh, so, for example, if the trains are sitting there, uh, they need to be maintained. So there are maintenance costs that are ongoing, so you need to move the trains, uh, make sure you don't get flat spots on wheels, those types of issues. And uh, there are... Uh, contractual costs as well associated with uh, the contracts in regards to the train sets that have been approved and are effectively ready for operation. So when when the, all those costs are added up, that's what the $30 million yes, is? Yes, there's, there's a number of costs that, that uh, contribute to uh, that number. Now, that number is actually a forecast somewhere down the track as well. As I said, yeah. these costs grow. Yeah, uh, That's not the cost at the moment. Now, I might turn at that point to Mr Collins, just given your experience in dealing with these issues. Can you, what data <coughs> can you give us on uh, these costs, these competing views uh, from these ministers about the billion-dollar cost? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, obviously, as the Secretary says, uh, there are a lot of options here. Um, I have been brought in the last six to eight weeks to uh, work with Matt, Dale and uh, Peter on a number of issues. One of the areas we've been focusing on is uh, the Marion fleet and understanding those issues. Uh, we have been working hard on clarifying and understanding uh, what the unions require. Uh, we have that clearly understood and we've been working obviously with our infrastructure colleagues on uh, what those costs would be. As the, the Secretary said, they have moved around a bit. Um, if you consider storage costs, for example, it's the cost of the security guards, the movement of the trains, and I think, as the Secretary said, that's um, just under a million dollars you know, per month at all these sites, places like Lithgow, Broadmeadow, which require a high level of security because they are um, fairly remote locations. Uh, we've been working on the fixed infrastructure costs, uh, and the idea is to try and get that as clear for Cabinet as possible. Uh, I think we're in a good position now, and therefore we believe we've got a, a figure which can go up to Cabinet. And will that figure be anywhere near the billion dollars? Again, as the Secretary indicated, the, um, the figure for the infrastructure and the train modifications is a lot less than a billion dollars. Uh, it would be inappropriate, I think, for me to comment on the figure uh, as it has moved a lot. Um, but I do believe that most of those costs are the uh, cost of delaying the contract, as the, as the Secretary mm. has indicated. Thank you. Um, can we just take a step back um, and I'll be guided by you, Mr Sharp, as to whether this is a question for Mr Collins or yourself. Um, can we just talk about how many... I understand there were 600 carriages that were ordered um, for the new intercity fleet. How many of them are currently in New South Wales? Yes, I will uh, pass to Mr Collins on the details of the number of trade sets. I believe, and, and maybe Mr Alloway can help me, I think there's 26 uh, 10 car sets available at the moment. That's 260 carriages out of uh, order fleet, which was extended. I think we originally were 550 or thereabouts. They are, I think, 550 now are 600. So there will be 60 trains which can make up a 10 car mm -hmm. set. They're, they're organised in a four and six car formation. This allows us to run obviously various numerous um, numbers of eight car trains where we need them and even shorter trains six or four car at quite a time so these trains uh, can be made up to 10 cars okay so we've currently got 260 that we're storing correct um when are we expecting the other six what what is it 400 and no i can't count 340 yes. 340 or thereabouts <laughs> yes um uh, some are in storage in Korea where they are made and others are obviously still in manufacture, <coughs> as I understand. But their arrangements, normally a, a couple of trains a month uh, would arrive into this country. Uh, that's the normal production process. But obviously 
whilst we cannot run these trains and the spaces for them to be stabled and stored uh, is getting smaller and smaller, um, it makes it more difficult to in incorporate those trains within New South Wales. And has there already been delays um, to what was contracted in terms of the carriages that have arrived in New South Wales? I, mean, I might hand that over to uh, Mr Alloway, but I believe that obviously uh, there have been delays in this contract for a number of reasons. Uh, but obviously now with what was a planned commissioning operation of the fleet several, several months ago, um, that um, there obviously has been delayed, which has put back the ability to get these trains into service. Mm -hmm. So, yes, and perhaps Mr Alloway, if you could Sorry. advise, has there been a delay because of the storage requirement? Um, um, I'd have to take that on notice, um, particularly around the, the, store, the specifics of the storage elements, but of course with the Marion fleet there were a number of delays, um, one of them including the COVID period as well, mm -hmm. um, which has kind of compounded the overall um, delay, delay timeline, so it's not specific to just that particular element, but I'd have to look at the specifics of that particular part about the storage. And take it on notice. Thank you. Unless Mr Merrick's got any detail on that. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. So um, we've had trains arrive um, as late as the last fortnight, so the trains continue to arrive as planned yep. and we're working through those storage issues. Have there been any additional costs under the contract as a result of not um, being able to store the trains or, or some other, let me put this again, has there been any additional costs to the government because of um, contractual terms uh, with the um, provider of the fleet because of the delays in actually putting these trains on the track? Yeah, thanks again for the question. Um, I couldn't say with certainty, but I'm happy to take that on notice um, to get those numbers if, if there has been a, um, um, the outcome you're describing. Thank you. Um, Mr Collins, in terms of the modifications that are being sought by um, the unions, and I think it's important here to note that although this has sort of made it into the news very much as a, as a union dispute, fundamentally we're talking about public safety here. Um, in terms of the safety concerns that have been raised in relation to that fleet, um, what modifications are being requested by the union? So, uh, firstly, I'd like to state that obviously the existing train and existing format has been approved by the safety regulator, by ONSA. But obviously, further discussions between the unions in their concerns and ourselves has led to uh, their proposals being put forward and us looking at the costs of those proposals. Um, it requires the guard to be at the rear of the train and requires modification to some buttons and some CCTV. Um, and that certainly was the, the request uh, from the unions, which we have worked through with them very positively and understood what their issues are. Um, and we are clear now that uh, what their uh, requirements will be. So when you say modifications to the buttons, um, is that the emergency buttons or the door buttons? Can you elaborate? Okay. Um, I know sometimes me going into detail is, is quite interesting for Parliament, but I will try and keep it as simple <laughs> as possible. Um, it involves the door controls mm -hmm. where the, the guard operates the open and close buttons. It involves the bell. Sorry. Above the door. The yeah, above the door. Well, in modern trains, they're in front of you or could be the side, but they're certainly uh, changing those positions from, from what was the the driver's panel to the back wall mm -hmm. uh, involves the bell button, that's the signal you give to the driver to allow him to proceed once all the doors are closed. Uh, it also involves an emergency stop button which has been repositioned so the guard can operate the stop button from his position and also it involves modifying the guard's door so it remains open a bit like a Waratah train for part of the journey outside of the, when, the, when the train departs. I know that one of the um, issues that were raised early on with this fleet was a concern that we would end up with guardless um, trains or that we would have a sort of a you know, more automated fleet that would require fewer, um, fewer workers. Um, is this, are these changes effectively, I guess, allowing a guard 
to perform their traditional role on the on the train? I think as the Secretary indicated earlier, in 2019, the then Transport Minister um, came to an agreement that there would be a second person on the train. Originally, the train was designed for driver-only operation, but an agreement was made, and then we have worked over, since 2019, over a number of uh, proposals and decisions to how the Guard would actually operate. Mm -hmm. And I know that both um, Mr Merrick and Mr Alloway have worked um, extensively with the unions on understanding what that means, and over the last six weeks we have sought that clarification. So, so we're in this position where, in effect, uh, the proposal, and it is only a proposal which obviously Cabinet have to decide upon, um, will operate the train in a similar way to our 120-odd Waratah trains which work on the network. So one of the concerns that was raised um, in relation to the trains without modification um, is that if you, if you were a passenger um, and say you, know, you, you were with your child and your child had fallen um, between the train and the platform and you were trying to get the guard's attention or the driver's attention, that the only um, mechanism for that would be to press a button that would then, um, an emergency button that would then call somebody that's not the driver, as far as I understand it, um, that would be, that would cause some delay. Um, is that the sort of thing that will be now fixed with these changes? I think just passing comment on that, um, this train is the, to the latest modern standards and in, in its various guises of operation, whether it's driver only or, or um, with a guard. Um, there are additional features. It's got excellent CCTV, external and internal. Uh, it has obviously emergency facilities on the, on the train to operate to notify uh, of an incident. And obviously at many of our stations, particularly those busy suburban ones, we do have staff on the platform um, to notify and warn the driver and now or the guard of you know something which has happened. But I think uh, everyone appreciates that uh, these things happen in a flash and are very quick to occur, and therefore obviously the unions have put forward the proposal of adding the guard as an additional facility. Mm -hmm. But we are working with uh, on Onza. Um, and understanding what these changes mean that we haven't yet got approval and our mm -hmm. view is that obviously it will be up to the safety regulator and cabinet to decide which way we go forward. And it does sound, and I'm glad you noted that not every, although on metropolitan stations we, we tend to have um, those stations being staffed, it's not always the case in a, in a, a more remote or regional um, or even outer suburban station. Yes. Um, my understanding is that the current design um, basically locks the crew in a sort of a soundproof cabin. So although there is CCTV, um, if you're not looking, uh, if you you know if you're driving and you're not looking at the CCTV at that time because you're you know understandably um, doing other things, uh, that you wouldn't even be able to hear or be alerted if there was some incident outside. I mean, there are many the train. many trains operate around the world where uh, there is a. The monitoring is done by CCTV. Some have opening windows, some have closed doors, some have opening doors. Um, you know, it is very difficult sometimes even detecting noise as well as vision, but I would say the modern Marion fleet has excellent CCTV. Um, but obviously that's, as you described, one of the um, issues that the unions have put forward. So would it be fair to say then, Mr Collins, that the the safety on that fleet could be improved and that the union's request is not unreasonable? That's um, an interesting question. The, the fleet as it stands um, has passed and is a safe train and has worked, you know, the proposals has been worked through our safety regulator. Obviously any other changes have to be risk assessed, understood. We are going through that process now. Obviously, that we will be going forward with um, understanding, provided government, gov sorry, government gives us approval to understand what that means in terms of whether it's safer as safe or as safe as reasonably practical. Um, you have a huge amount of experience um, 
in this area. Um, we've had many interesting conversations about um, train design and, um, and rail uh, network design in the past. Um, I understand that there is a process to go through in relation to these safety modifications, but in your experience, uh, these um, modifications being proposed by the unions will increase the safety of these trains, won't it? I think a number of reports have come through uh, from various independent uh, authorities to say that the current operation was, was safe. Um, I think my personal view um, is that obviously we're working through with the unions. I've, I've worked on driver-only trains, automatic trains, guard and driver trains. It's all about their relative safety and what the situation faces at the time. I think uh, whilst I could give you a view, I think it's not appropriate at this stage other than the fact that we will be doing a full risk assessment and understand what position we are going to be with the, the proposals which have been worked through with the unions. Um, but you, you know, a lot of people can make their own judgment about this, but I think at this stage uh, we will see what the outcome of those risk assessments are. Um, in relation to these modifications then that you have specified, um, some of these would go across the whole train set, presumably, like the, the, the guard store, um, uh, changing the, or well, perhaps not all the door controls, but some, some of them appear to be per kind of set of 10, whereas perhaps the modifications, um, some of the other modifications would require a per carriage modification. Is that correct? Most of the modifications proposed are actually in the guards compartment and obviously as you change ends what was the <coughs> compartment becomes the guards mm -hmm. so if you look at all uh, you know 60 uh, you know uh, train sets obviously um, they all have two uh, two cabs sometimes they have four because obviously you've got a six and a ten so if you multiply four times 60 equals 240 cabs I think if uh, my maths correct me if I've got that wrong um, so those modifications will have to take place on all those cabs eventually. Mm -hmm. So not all 600, but no. 230 but will have to be modified. For the, for the record, I think there may be some software modifications and some minor changes uh, in how the, the carriages operate, mm -hmm. um, particularly the emergency uh, with the communication button and the way the door opening buttons which exist uh, for customers operate but mm -hmm. the physical work and I think most of the proposed activity which we've now locked in with the unions is in the, the guards stroke mm -hmm. drivers cab. Okay um, and who will do that work? Well obviously the manufacturer who has built the trains we have been working closely with our infrastructure and in place colleagues who are working with Rail Connect mm -hmm. uh, and they have been uh, producing the mock-up designs, they have been looking at the overall costs and working with our infrastructure and place colleagues who are actually responsible for the project. Are there provisions in the contract um, with the manufacturer to, um, that covers modifications of this kind? I mean, like any contract, you know, you normally, once you've put your order in for a train or a car or whatever, and then halfway through you ask, for it to be changed, there are obviously costs involved, but mm -hmm. obviously we work very closely and the project team have worked very closely with the manufacturers to ensure we understand the real costs and, mm -hmm. the, and uh, we will work through those in detail. At this stage, it is very early days, but we have had some estimates of what those costs would be um, per modification. So would it be fair to say there are two types of costs then? There are the costs for the trains that have, or the carriages have already been delivered um, that will now need to be modified uh, as opposed to the ones that are yet to be manufactured and delivered. Would that, are they different costs? Would you expect it to be would the built in cost to the newly manufactured carriages to be cheaper? I, I can't say for certain because obviously that's, that's an issue that we might have to take on notice. But if I explain in, in general terms, uh, we believe that the modifications of those units which are here in New South Wales will be done at Kangangi by um, Connect, Rail Connect staff um, following obviously a lot of design work and uh, testing 
um, whether the other trains which are currently in the manufacture will be modified at the factory or whether they will arrive and be modified um, is something I can't mm -hmm. uh, tell you at this stage. Okay, understood. Um, thank you very much for all of that. It's given a very clear picture of what is being asked for and what, what you know, I guess we can um, imagine um, the cost of that because I understand you're not in a position to tell us exactly how much. Um, however, it has been stated that this, the cost of these modifications would be um, less than the, the cost of delaying further, um, which is very useful to know. Um, but given that the entire fleet and the contract for the entire fleet, I think was put at 2.8 billion, is that correct? correct. Um, the assertion uh, by Minister Tudor Hope that the modifications could cost a billion dollars is quite absurd, isn't it? Uh, I can't comment on uh, on your statement. Uh, at the end of the day, what we're doing is putting up a number of options. There are costs associated with it, and Cabinet will need to make a, a decision on those options. The, the, uh, the costs are significant. Um, did Minister Tudor Hope uh, ask you how much the cost would be before he made that statement? Uh, we've uh, provided uh, all the ministers, including DPC and a number of stakeholders, with drafts of the Cabinet submission as we're working through uh, the options in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really landing a cabinet submission that articulates the options yeah. uh, and in some ways covers all the risks and concerns that the various stakeholders have. Did, During did, that process there would have been draft numbers in mm -hmm. those documents. Did any of those documents have a draft number of a billion dollars for modifications? Uh, it would be inappropriate for me to comment on what's in a <coughs> cabinet document. Uh, the bottom line is numbers have been moving and there's a, num a number of numbers depending on which scenario you look at. In uh, the time that you have been working on this, have you at any time had uh, it proposed to you that the modifications would cost a billion dollars? Uh, no. Uh, what, uh, what the process is that we work with the unions to understand the detail mm -hmm. and we are still working through uh, those as we speak. Uh, mm -hmm. We still need to land a final agreement in terms of what those uh, changes would be. Clearly, if we're asking uh, Cabinet to sign off, we would need a position. Uh, and likewise, the unions would want us to agree to an operating model mm -hmm. associated with those. Uh, so, so we're at a point where that is about to be agreed. That will then actually generate the final numbers. Understood. So, so it is still moving. But Minister Tudor Hope, who is also the Minister for Finance, um, just decided $1 billion was the amount for the modifications? Uh, as I said, uh, there's been a number of draft documents uh, and uh, he would have uh, been privy to uh, the evolving uh, numbers and the evolving calculations mm. for, for multiple scenarios. Mm. So he should have known better than to say $1 billion. Uh, You'd have to ask Mr. Tudor. Um, good try. I will. Really try. I, will. I, <laughs> I will enjoy doing that. Um, my time is almost up, so we will come back to um, the rest of my questions. Uh, Chair, I did, did but, um, want to just make yes, one comment. Please. The, uh, the Marion is unambiguously safe. What we're talking about in terms of safety conversations is a package. Uh, safety is not ever just one item. And what we're actually doing is working with the unions around what does that safety package look like. And safety is always layers of controls, and uh, we're very keen to ensure that those controls and the package of those controls deliver a safe outcome. So I just want to make sure the public is fully aware that these trains are safe and will be safe and uh, both the unions and ourselves have that as the highest priority through this process. I'm glad you raised that though because safety is not an absolute concept, is it? When we talk about something being safe, um, something can also be safer uh, and made safer. So when you're talking about it being safe, you must have some sort of a risk assessment at the back of your mind in order to make that assumption. Correct, and, and there's a risk assessment that uh, is jointly uh, completed with the union uh, uh, bodies and uh, that is actually then tabled with ONSA. So the process uh, before the trains uh, operate in their final configuration uh, mm -hmm. will, will be subject to a full risk assessment. Uh, the safe, safer uh, conversations will be had mm -hmm. and we'll be presenting that to ONSA for, for their accreditation. So that process will take some uh, months and we'll be working through that assiduously. Because the public's tolerance for risk when it comes to safety might be a little different to uh, the governments or to um, to the regulators as well. I mean, it's, uh, you, have, be right. you have uh, three people here who are ultimately 
uh, responsible for the safety of the rail system. Um, uh, Mr. Merrick, Mr. Alloway, uh, Matt and myself. And uh, we have safety as our highest priority. It is, it is not negotiable. So I just want to make sure that it's not just the government. Uh, we actually have full accountability to the regulators and uh, we take that very seriously. Thank you. Uh, Mr Beach? Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to continue on a little bit with uh, some of the matters arising from the last line of questioning, if I can. Probably Mr Sharp to start with, but can I just want to clarify, first of all, I think Mr Collins, you said um, that there were sta you were stabling some of these at Lithgo. Is that, so there's two different things here, stabling and storage. Yeah, they're the same thing. If I clarify storage, that they are stable and Lithgow under storage, if I yeah. make that clear. So yeah. it's an existing yard, though. It's an existing yard. If you, it, they're on both sides, if you know the area, yeah. uh, there's some which are stored on, on the upside of, of Lithgow and there are some on the downside. On the downside, well. yeah. So can I just say, uh, can I just ask, there would already be security at that, at that yard, would there not? Not normally in a, in a, in those rail lines which come under Matt Longland, um, we might have some sort of visiting security for for obviously existing sets of trains, okay. but of course um, we've added some additional security uh, to ensure that these brand new trains are protected. Uh, they tend to be the subject of attack of graffiti vandals, and also the trains themselves. So the, um, the decision was made to ensure that we provided. Um, you know, levels of security which protect those brand new assets. Okay, and can I just ask then, uh, going forward, um, obviously there will be driver and guard training for the operation of the Marymount. If Marymount. I refer this to Mr Dale Barrett, because Dale is in charge of the driver and guard training for New South Wales trains. Yeah, thanks Mr Howard, thanks for the question. So, um, as has been previously discussed, when, when we finalise the operating model for the Marymount fleet, that is um, supported by Cabinet, we'll then work through a, an appropriate training and competency package for the train. Okay, and how long will that take to implement? Uh, I wouldn't like to put a time on it given the changes are not yet finalised, so obviously that package will reflect uh, any of the changes compared to the current state. Okay, thank you. And what was the, this might be for you Mr Sharp, but the, the total final cost of the, uh, the new city fleet given the ongoing maintenance budget for these? Uh, if you're looking at the whole of life costs, I'd have to yes. take that on notice. Yeah, that is, the budget is. for the actual uh, acquisition was $2.8 billion. At the whole of life? Yes, I'd have to take that on notice. Okay, thank you. And so, we've, so there's been, um, as I understand, 56 additional carriages purchased on top of the, the original contract. Um, were they uh, at the same price as the original contract, or was there a variation on price on the oh, I'd carriages? have to take that on notice uh, in regards to that latest acquisition. Um, if you're taking that on notice, it would be nice to know if there was an increase in price, uh, just what that was uh, per carriage. Yes, we'll, uh, we'll revert with that information. Yep. So now we were talking about the, the bill for the storage life of the rolling stock. Um, where does that, is that being put on as a part of the original, I guess, capital cost of these, or is it being taken across into the uh, recurrent budget? Uh, it's a, an interesting technical question which I've discussed with the accounting team. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't recollect where it landed, but suffice to say there's costs that do end up in operations. Uh, so one of those costs, for example, would be if you're expending money and it's not actually delivering a physical asset, you can't put it into the assets. It's got to actually uh, come through into your operating budget and be covered through that. Uh, so as part of this current budget process, we are actually looking through that and the accounting team are looking at which part of the appropriation process some of those dollars will land. Uh, I, I can't uh, advise exactly what dollars will end up where because we're still working through that at the moment. So what sort of thing, what sort of costs would then be included? Uh, in so for action? example, if uh, uh, there's sensors, blazers that yeah. are uh, on the railway stations and uh, it helps align the trains, uh, if we needed to relocate those, that relocation cost, whilst it's part of the project, it's not creating an asset, it's moving an asset. So therefore that would be an operational expense, just to give you an example. Yeah. And we're working through pretty much every component of, of the uh, contract and changes to see what uh, would be capitalised. The primary changes, however, which are the ones to the actual carriages, that's actually creating an asset, you're, you're putting equipment on, uh, that would be uh, capitalisable. Okay. Because it's important, I think, to delineate between the two. You need to understand, have a clear picture of what you're actually portioning to the recurrent 
your Correct. operating budget. Yeah. What I will say is the bulk of it, from, from what I've seen to date, is capital. Uh, yep. There's not, not a large impact to the operational uh, expense line. Okay. And so there's, but there's been no morphing at this stage from capital to recurrent? No. Okay. Um, as a part of the rectifications, um, as I understand, there's, if you've been talking through these today, there's, there's quite a number of those. I think we spoke about the, the security cameras. Um, but uh, can I, one of the issues is these things operate uh, in a range of different weather conditions. Um, and so the testing of these in a range of different weather co weather conditions, um, predominantly weather at the moment in Sydney, but you know, it can also get quite hot in Sydney. Um, has that work been undertaken? So when you say that the CCTVs are the best, for instance, Mr Collins, mm -hmm. have they been tested in the quite diverse <coughs> weather conditions that they're going to be exposed to in the Sydney uh, and outer metropolitan lines? Yeah, I, I'm talking in general of, of rolling stock commissioning, which I've been involved in in quite a few fleets, uh, I would imagine, and again we could probably provide on notice, that the significant testing happens uh, within um, the manufacturing plant. In fact, I think it, um, in the manufacturing plant they've got a test track, they're able to operate these trains at high speed under different conditions. Um, and certainly prior to the protective industrial action, a number of these trains have been out uh, on the network um, operating and testing uh, under various conditions and um, and certainly the um, they are very good trained they've certainly operated well and the great thing about modern technologies we know from our mobile phones is that you start off with a very grainy picture when we first started putting in CCTV which in my day was in the 80s and when you get to this modern technology it certainly provides um, excellent uh, quality there are obviously occasions where things don't work or there's an obstruction or sunlight, but the advantage is with cameras pointing in every dire each direction on each car, um, you get an opportunity for examining the best view at the time. Okay. Yep. Thank you. I'll just ask Mr Merrick to comment on that as well. We have done extensive testing in, in the commissioning stage here in Australia. Yeah, thanks, Secretary, and thanks for the, um, the question. Um, I, I think if I spoke more broadly about what the train offers. So in the current configuration as accredited, um, th this train has next generation safety features but also customer features. And the safety features include sensitive door edge technology for obstructions, uh, the traction interlocking for all the doors, um, and the CCTV is significant in that there are 40 external cameras on this train. So every car has two cameras on each side. So what that does compared to today is it affords the guard and the driver a full view of the platform yeah. and the train interface. And um, m most importantly about that, it provides a triangulated response to that interface in all conditions. So um, for those curved platforms and for those parts of the network that are exposed to weather conditions, um, the, as has been stated, the CCTV quality is, um, is really good and it's been proven over that testing and commissioning phase. Okay. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Can I just, um, when, do the, when do we estimate then with all the, the stuff that's going on at the moment, all the activity, when do we expect these trains? On your Gantt charts, I know public servants love Gantt charts, when, on your Gantt chart, when will the first passengers be walking on these trains? Uh, look, at the moment, it's going to depend on uh, the Cabinet decision uh, on uh, which scenario uh, they go with. So it would be preemptive to say, here's a date. Uh, clearly, uh, we know all the trains uh, at the moment are on uh, contractually to be delivered by June 24, is my understanding, uh, and we would like to see them in service as quickly as possible. Now, with changes that are required to the train set, that will take a little bit of time, so there'll be clearly an extension of the program. But uh, the unions are working very closely with us to look at uh, how do we get some services up and running on the approved line, which is uh, to Newcastle, and how can we expedite that safely. So there will be some interim uh, services uh, that we'll be providing that to the customers and then behind the scenes over time we'll do the changes and then we'll roll those, uh, those back into the new operating model. So there'll be an interim step uh, to actually get uh, what are high quality uh, latest technology trains into service as soon as we can. So, so Newcastle first? Essentially, yes, just that's, a, uh, that's almost like an operational That's test. accredited already. And yep. so uh, we're looking at a model in terms of how can we uh, get some services on onto uh, that already accredited route uh, as soon as we can, yep. and then we'll work on the program to uh, implement 
whatever the final agreed uh, changes are, and we'll set a program up around that. And do you have an idea then about how quickly after the Newcastle, almost a trial or test run of those trains on that run, but how long after Newcastle line and they're operational, how long will they be in the other lines? Uh, the plan was always to uh, have that particular uh, route uh, first cab off yep. the run, and then we would move to the risk assessments of each route. So the process with ONSA is uh, for each route, you yep. do a risk assessment specific to that route. And, and that's because the conditions uh, vary, the, vary yeah. the nature of the platforms um, uh, vary. Okay. So uh, the process would be to uh, get the uh, whatever the final agreed position is approved, and then we would look to move on to those other routes and, and methodically work through the risk assessments for those other routes. Okay, thank you. But we'd question. need to do a secure ONSA's approval before we could obviously uh, yeah, deploy services. And the last question before I hand over to my colleague, uh, Mr Graham, we would just go back to the driver and guard training. Are you looking at doing that, developing that training in-house, or will you go outside to uh, uh, get someone pass to do Mr Merrick to answer that. Yeah, um, thanks again for the follow-up question. So um, most definitely in-house. So the training and competency package that was developed for the current state train, um, we would see it as a modification of that internal package. Okay. I just want to return, Mr Sharp, to the events of the 12th of May. Uh, I've talked about the ministers disagreeing, but on that morning, the Deputy Secretary of the Department was writing a letter about these negotiations, so this is on track. Uh, hours later, uh, ministers are up issuing a rallying call to their colleagues to draw a line in the sand on these negotiations. Can you tell us what was going on to get these very different public signals? Uh, well, firstly, the uh, letter uh, wasn't public, it was to the unions and it was very much part of the process that we were going through with the uh, seven-week intensive bargaining. So through that process, uh, as you would imagine, uh, 300 claims coming down to a smaller number as well as working through the Marion. Uh, the Marion uh, had a number of different options and, uh, this, as I said, there's been a lot of negotiations around that. That letter was to... Uh, basically articulate the conversations we were having with the unions at that time in respect to what that particular option would look like. Mm. So it was totally separate to uh, any external commentary that arose by the ministers. Uh, it was very much part of what I'd call the BAU process of negotiating uh, through that. There are a number of letters uh, but that they're I've very, as well. They're very different signals, aren't they, Mr Sharp? When that letter was written, were you aware these ministers were going to do a press conference? Uh, no, I wasn't aware. Were you aware before that press conference happened that these ministers were going to do a press conference? I wasn't aware uh, that there was a press conference until uh, late the evening before. Until and, late. And, and so as, as a consequence, uh, uh, I saw that as uh, I wasn't privy to what the press conference uh, yeah. details were about. So um, you knew there was going to be a press conference, correct. but you didn't know that these ministers were going to issue this rallying call, what some saw as an attempt to blow up the negotiations. Uh, I, I don't know... Uh, how you would uh, some present of. that, but yeah. uh, uh, there have been a number of press conferences around uh, the industrial relations, uh, so I, I wasn't surprised there would be a press conference. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is fair. The, the actual letter, though, um, there are letters that I've seen as well where we've agreed on certain uh, parameters within the enterprise agreement's terms and conditions, and I've written a very similar letter to uh, the Deputy Secretary of ROM, mm. Uh, indicating our position on those to say, well, we've worked through them and, and we'll, we'll be looking to develop a scenario based on those. Uh, that was a similar letter in regards to the structure of what the operating model might look like. Thank you for that. I want to come to the outstanding issues. You've said in the next week or two weeks this might come to the mm -hmm. RC and to Cabinet uh, to resolve this. I want to understand what is the hold-up, what are the outstanding issues I think you've been really clear, and I appreciate it, that the financial side of this will be dealt with in a range of options, mm. and Cabinet will have to choose. Um, are there any other outstanding issues? Why can't this go today? Um, let me put one of the specifics to you. Is one of the reasons because ministers have issued a late request uh, for a clause to be inserted in the enterprise agreement, allowing the enterprise agreement to be reopened and that that request was made as little as a week ago. Is that one of the outstanding issues here uh, that's there's, holding this there's up? Been, uh, how can I put it? There's been about 20 or 30 core items uh, that we've been negotiating in detail with the unions. Uh, things such as a deed that we have in place uh, which protects employees uh, in the event of changes to the business structure. 
there's uh, clauses in the actual enterprise agreements, whether you have two agreements or a single agreement. Those have been uh, worked through and those agreements have uh, clauses such as the uh, what we refer to as Clause 12, I think it's Clause 7 in the New South Wales Trains Agreement. These are around uh, decision-making uh, protocols in terms of changes. And there's, uh, as, as you're aware, an enterprise agreement goes for a period of time. There are, the world doesn't stay still and there will be uh, changes that occur. And there's some, for example, which uh, would be, an example would be the regional fleet, for example. I would envisage somewhere in the next three years that uh, that All regional right, fleet... Mr would Sharp, I'm going to bring you back to the question, is this one of the sticking points? Is this one of the hold-ups? Is this one of the reasons why this isn't in front of Cabinet uh, today? Uh, this Graham, I wouldn't, I wouldn't refer to it as a hold-up. Yeah. Uh, I just I see this as yeah. part of these items that we've been negotiating. Yeah. And yes, we're down to... There's probably two or three. Yeah. Uh, we still have to actually physically uh, exchange an agreement on what those modifications would be. Uh, yep. That's that's uh, still to be nailed. Uh, there are a, a couple of uh, clauses in the enterprise agreements where uh, we've been working through that, and uh, clearly uh, there's there's lawyers and legal advice uh, that one takes on uh, something like this, and I know uh, the union bodies are also uh, considering that through their executive uh, forums. Uh, but that's to me, they're significant issues that require some sort of agreement and we're, we're looking to expedite those and we're down to those couple uh, to then put a paper up to the cabinet. Okay. I, I want to turn to the safety concerns as my colleague was asking. This, the concerns that have been raised without making a judgement about them are whether or not if there was an incident, if someone fell between the uh, gap between the platform and the train for example, you might not be able to <coughs> see it directly, perhaps through CT, CCTV, you might not be able to hear it given the conditions. How often is this happening? How often are passengers falling between the gap uh, in the Greater Sydney train network? Uh, I'd have to take that on notice, uh, but I'll pass to Mr Longland to comment specifically on that, that risk in the Sydney network. Um, thanks, Mr Sharp. Uh, yes, yeah, so the platform train interface is obviously a very important uh, factor in customers boarding trains and ensuring that they're clear of the doors or that they're not um, actually in between the gap between the platform and the, uh, and the train. Our network is very, uh, parts of it are very old and we're dealing with things like curved platforms, the geometry of modern railways and having... Mr them. Long, I've caught a train before. How often is this happening? Look, I'd have to uh, take that on notice to get the details. It's not a regular occurrence, but it's certainly something that all of our staff are trained to manage and to look out for, whether they're platform staff, whether they're guards or whether they're drivers. I'm going to quote to you when you say it's not a regular occurrence from, the, um, from a transport document. Removing the gap between trains and our platforms remains an important and complex challenge with an average of five people falling between the gaps on the Greater Sydney Trains network every week. Is that accurate, Mr Longman? That sounds pretty regular. That, thank you for the follow-up. I'd need to see the document that you're referring to and understand the context in yep. which it was written and when it was written. But as I said, it, it's a key safety consideration, managing the, the interface between the platform and the train. Well, this is the future transport draft strategy, which says there's a person falling between the gap once every workday. Is that an accurate statement? This is your own document. Oh, I'd need to take that notice and, and confirm that. Mr Sharp? Uh, as Mr Longman said, I, I'm aware of uh, this being a key safety issue. Uh, we have actually put gap fillers uh, in uh, some of the congested stations, such as Circular Quay. Uh, and we actually have a program where we're looking at can that technology yeah. solution be expanded. But so clear, cl clearly we're aware that that's a risk. In terms of the specific numbers, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, with Mr Longwood, I'd have to see yeah, the But as document. Mr Collins says, this can happen in a flash. These things can happen in a flash. Yeah. Um, this is the key issue in this dispute. How, how risky are these platforms? And you don't seem to be aware of how frequently this is occurring. Mr Longman no, we, says, we are aware. it's not we very just... often your own documents say this is one person every work day falling in between the platform and the train. Uh, Mr Graham, we've said we'd look at the document. There's a lot of documents and context. We'll have a look at it. Uh, in terms of the risk, yes, it is a risk, but it's one of many risks. Uh, the risks are actually managed through multiple uh, ways. So we do have actually staff on platforms. We do have... Uh, 
new technologies. We but as you sit on there now, Mr well. Sharp, you can't tell me how often this is happening. I can't tell you an exact number. You've quoted a, a number from a document. We'd need to look at that document. Well, I'm saying to you, your, your department says it's one person every work day. They also say this. This is particularly exacerbated for people with reduced mobility, including people with disability and elderly passengers. Yeah. I'm just, just to add, Mr Graham, um, I look at the safety document every morning just to see what's happened. Um, people falling through onto the plat onto the below the train is quite rare, once or twice, three times a year. People stumbling, you know, and getting tripping and injuring themselves, possibly out of 850,000 trips in a day, one or two will be reported. Um, we are working very hard on that. We obviously, as you know, as a regular train traveller, we do a lot of information to advise customers and make sure that they keep well clear. I'm going to hand to my colleague, uh, Mr Collins, but I might just put that quote to you again. An average of five people falling between the gaps on the Greater Sydney Trains Network every week. Yeah, that's the one he wants to use for the press conference. Yeah, the, the okay, just, order. just to clarify, if I may, um, falling between might be that the fact you've just, your leg has dropped in it, it's not... I think it might be worth us verifying. It's not as if people fall literally between the train and end up under the train. I think we'll have a look at that data, but it is maybe factually true, and we'll check that, that um, we do get people, as you know, trip or end up injuring themselves or even not injuring themselves and stumble either out of the train or into it. And we've seen that on CCTV and news articles as well. Just um, clarification for the transcript. Are you able to um, tell us a bit more about what that document oh, is. So I've described the um, document. Yeah. Okay. Do maybe perhaps the page number. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I will do that page to. Uh, I I will supply that page number. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Um, we are going to break just for a five minute tea break. There's tea and coffee behind you. Um, and uh, yeah, we will be back at. Let's make it ten forty five. Right. Welcome back. Um, hope you're refreshed after your seven and a half minute break. Um, <laughs> very generous. Um, can I just, oh, they're testing the bells, that's great. Um, can I just uh, go back a bit to the cost issue? So we have talked at length now about the cost of the, the modifications. Um, and we, you have told us, Mr Sharp, that the, um, the cost of those modifications is lower than the costs of, um, I think it was referred to as prolongation, which is the, the storage or the kind of shedding cost um, and the, you know, moving them around and um, whatever it is that you do for the wheels um, and contractual costs as well. Um, can I just refer, and I think um, my colleague Mr Graham referred to this as well, that there was a statement by Minister Keane that, uh, let me find it, um, the fleet has been sitting in sheds at a cost of $30 million a month to the taxpayer. Um, I think we already have your evidence, Mr Sharp, that that's actually more like a million dollars of actual um, cost to store. Correct. Um, and does that include, um, so you said it includes the staffing costs of the person who actually has to maintain them? There's some security mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's the actual costs of actually housing them. Uh, then there's... Uh, other costs such as the maintenance. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can't have the trains just sitting there. Uh, ideally, you would want to move them. Uh, there's activities that you would do as a maintenance program on those trains. So for warranty purposes, you would still need to maintain your contractual commitments. So some of those costs per month are driven by that. And obviously, that grows over time as you get more train sets. Mm -hmm. And as time goes on, the nature of the maintenance activities uh, increases. So uh, you'll see an increasing uh, tail and that's that's up to 30 million over a period of time. That was where that number okay. was referenced. Uh, it's not not a current cost at the moment, but it could potentially be if there were further delays. It, it's one of the scenario costs. So it's about a million at the moment. Correct. So that includes. Let's just sorry take that step back again. So that includes staff, security, maintenance um, at the moment, plus presumably the cost of the 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 rent of the land, or are we sitting on we're sitting on Transport owned land at Kangiangi, right? So, yes, just to confirm, uh, Broadmeadow, Lithgow, Kangiangi is all actually Tahi transport asset holding entity land now. So, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, Dale, whether there's other locations, but I think we've found those sites. 
Uh, the double deck trains obviously are fairly restricted in where they can be stored. They can't be stored out in the west somewhere because they're taller than the average train, so um, we have to find sites which accommodate double deck trains. Mm -hmm. And have you had to move other trains out of those sites in order to accommodate this? Has there been any, or was it already sort of excess space, I it's guess? It's a bit like parking in your garage. It's more full than it used to be, but we are working through that, and mm -hmm. we've managed to juggle the other fleets around with uh, our fleet team, so okay. Uh, so there's, okay. there's no flow-on kind of cost from that. Okay, so now I understand what that one million is. Um, Mr. Sharp, when you say that that will increase over time, that seems quite a radical jump from 1 million to 30 million. How many years are we talking before we would get to that 30 million figure? No, the 30 million includes uh, other costs. Uh, the 30 million has a storage cost component to it, mm -hmm. and that would obviously grow. In fact, it would be a challenge because I don't think we could continue to park all the train sets as they come in. Yeah. Uh, so there would be costs, presumably. Uh, for the manufacturer to store them uh, in their facilities. So over time there would be some increase in the storage costs, mm -hmm. but it's not 1 million to 30 million. Mm -hmm. The 1 million is a component of other costs, which include maintenance. What I'm saying is the 30 million number is a few years out in terms of what that forecast might look like. But hang on, it's not 1 million to 30 million, it's a, 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 a small portion of the 30 million would relate to storage. Right. Sorry, when I'm talking about storage costs and that 1 million, I thought we just got to the point where we agreed that the one million included the, the physical kind of, store, the, the cost of storage being the staff, security, the maintenance. Not the maintenance. Not the maintenance. So the one million is just for staff and security. It, it's for storage costs. So to get a full breakdown, I'd have to take that on notice. But uh, it's the cost of actually physically parking them and protecting them. Mm -hmm. Then there's a separate contractual commitment around mm -hmm. maintaining those uh, train sets and there's quite okay. a large number of them here yep. and the maintenance costs associated with that are part of that 30 million. So it's over and above the storage. Okay. Dif different cost centre. Okay, fine. Um, so staff and security, a million at the moment. We wouldn't expect that to change markedly unless there was a need to start housing these um, uh, these carriages in somewhere else, for example, with the manufacturer. Or, okay, fine. So it's one million at the moment. Um, then we have the maintenance amount. Can you tell me at the moment how much that maintenance cost is? Uh, no, I can't tell you that. I'd have to take it on notice. Uh, it's bundled up into uh, other numbers which I don't have uh, here. So uh, we would have to take on notice what the actual maintenance cost is at the moment. Okay. The, but the $30 million includes a forecast into the future mm -hmm. of what that might uh, be. Okay. And I understood from your previous answer that the 30 million was where we might get to in yep. the future. Correct. You can't tell me what it is now? Uh, the 30 million would be around 15 to 20 million is the, is the bookend or the equivalent now. I just haven't got the breakdown of all okay. the components of that. Okay, so Minister Keane wasn't wildly out. Um, he'd sort of doubled it perhaps. Um, well, he talked he... He talk to the future cost if uh, uh, if uh, these trains are continuing to sit there. Yeah, it wasn't Which really is... clear from his statement, but that's fine. I'm, let's be generous. Um, yes, that's good. And when, do, when would we get to this 30 million then, if we're currently around the 15, 20? When is it forecast that it would reach 30 million? Uh, we've got a number of scenarios. Uh, if agreement isn't reached, for example, what, 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 what are the next negotiation stages with the unions and how long would the program go for? Costs associated with that, would include ongoing storage and, in fact, storage of other train sets that are currently coming off production lines. Yeah. So, that, so there's, there's scenarios, and the cost on each of those scenarios does vary. But the 30 million is indicative, uh, I think it's two, three years out I'm, right. I'm, so, from, uh, from memory. Few, okay, so in a few years' time, um, based on it continuing to be delayed. Um, Correct. Yeah. Okay, uh, which would then be, we'd be looking at 360 million a year. Um, and I think we've agreed that that 360 million per year in storage costs um, would far outweigh the cost of modifications that are being requested by the unions. That's correct. Uh, it, it depends on the scenarios and the numbers that we finalise, and mm. uh, that'll be all set out in the cabinet paper. But you did say earlier, did you not, that the physical cost, the cost of modifications, 
are a lot less than the prolongation costs. Correct. Right. And the prolongation costs are storage and contractual. But in terms of comparing one to another, there's a, there's a lot of other costs and whole of life uh, costings and so you, and prolongation. So the actual comparisons for a decision are uh, much more complex than just comparing those two numbers. Uh, because there are other there are other costs involved, mm. uh, including program management, assumptions around contractual positions and penalties, mm -hmm. uh, warranty implications. Those those are actually quite complex. Mm. Uh, so the decision is actually made around a package of things that will drive costs. But but you're right. There's a reference point there in terms of if you didn't do anything, yeah. and, and you ended up with protracted negotiations. There are some sizable costs sure. uh, that would be incurred. I think that that premise is correct. Okay, but we're still looking at something that is for the prolongation cost, which is far below a billion or even 500 million. Is that correct? Yes, it's a small portion of the headline numbers. Yes. The actual physical cost uh, to change the train sets. Sorry, my, that wasn't my question, but I, that's where I was going to. So um, would it be fair then to say that the cost of um, making the changes, as has now been agreed with the union, um, are below 300,000, sorry, 300 million. Look, it would be, be inappropriate for me to talk to a specific cost out of context. Um, there's, okay. there's a lot of, lot of costs uh, that, that add up and, uh, and you need to compare bookend. So bookend would be do nothing, another would be to, to do the changes and implement. There's also some other uh, in-between options that we could potentially uh, discuss with the union. So uh, Cabinet needs to make a call on those. Okay. And, 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 but you're right, they're the comparisons that will be made. Uh, yeah. It's just that it's not as straightforward as here's a number versus another number. It seems from the um, evidence that's been provided so far that the negotiations on these safety modifications with the unions has been going quite well. Would that be fair to say? Uh, it's been part of... Uh, an intensive bargaining uh, period. Mm -hmm. uh, I would describe the uh, bargaining period as being uh, very productive. Uh, both parties have come together. And when I say both parties, there's a number of unions. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been uh, negotiating with 60 or 70 delegates on a daily basis and then uh, distilling at an executive level down to core items for each of the unions. Mm -hmm. uh, I would describe uh, the uh, Seven weeks has been very productive and it has moved the conversation forward with the Marion in terms of what those potential options might be. Yeah. Um, Mr Collins, is that your view as well? That we've sort of, you've got to the point now where things are pretty much agreed or, or um, are no longer as contentious with the unions on these safety modifications? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. I think uh, obviously uh, Mr Longlin and Sam Abadira, uh, Dale, uh, Merrick and the team have worked extremely hard and I'd say over many days and long hours to thrash out what were 300 claims mm. to a number which is reasonable and I think uh, obviously I provided a little bit of, uh, of, of my hard-earned experience over 25 years of well, two EAs here and uh, quite a few in other countries where um, it is sitting down and understanding each other's points of view and going through that um, and uh, discussing those items in detail. And I think uh, I would commend uh, the work that Mr Longley has achieved in that time along with Mr Merrick. Um, and I think we're in a, in a clearer position than we have been. Um, and I certainly believe the opportunity now for, for Cabinet to review where we've got to uh, mm -hmm. and uh, make, you know, obviously make a decision on the proposals that Mr Sharp talks about. Um, Mr. Sharp, I'm looking at a, uh, an email um, that you sent out on the 6th of May um, that is entitled End of Six Week Intensive Negotiations with Rail Unions. Um, you, um, you say in here, um, it's basically it's a very positive um, email that you've, you've sent out. Um, you say that, uh, quote, we covered a lot of material when you met with delegates and, and have made really good progress. Um, uh, there was a strong focus to address priorities in the log of claims in areas including safety. Um, do, on the 6th of May, um, were you happy with the progress of 
the um, negotiations with the unions? Uh, at a high level, yes. Uh, we had hoped to actually nail uh, what I call the core claims in the first couple of weeks. And the reality is it took us about four weeks to really get to that point. So uh, whilst it was positive and it was heading in the right direction, there were elements of that uh, that were pretty key to the timelines in terms of getting cabinet submissions and being able to run costings. So uh, productive, but probably not quite as quick as we had hoped. Uh, mm -hmm. The reality is that uh, uh, 60 people around a room uh, and, and negotiating uh, 300 claims down uh, was actually quite challenging. Uh, the team, I, I echo Mr Collins' comments, the team has worked uh, extremely hard and also I, I acknowledge the unions. Um, uh, a lot of their delegates have come in uh, from different parts of the state mm. and uh, there's been a concerted effort. Uh, yes, uh, good position. Now, good position means do we have a good understanding of each other's positions mm -hmm. and are we landing some consensus around some of these. Uh, one of, the, one of the things I've learned, until you actually get it in writing and you start to put it into what an EA clause might look like, uh, there's always ongoing conversation because when you see things in black and white, you can interpret the words differently or the nuance uh, in the context of a, a legal document becomes more challenging. Mm -hmm. And so there's been separate working groups working through that level of detail. Yep. So it is pleasing to have got to the point where that detail has been achieved in a short period of time. So that... Um the NIF Marion Working Group, um, had that concluded and reported back by that the time you sent that email on the 6th? Uh, it's ongoing. Okay. And it's still ongoing uh, even even now. So uh, the working groups are actually working through the mock-ups. Mm -hmm. What would it look like? Is it going to work in practice? Uh, that uh, is the item that I mentioned earlier. What are those couple of items that are core to being wrapped up? Yep. Getting a final agreement in writing with the unions. Uh, and, and as equally, they want us to commit in writing to the operating model. Yeah. Uh, that needs to still be landed, and there's been meetings even uh, as of yesterday on that particular topic. But in principle, agreement had been reached prior uh, to the 6th of May, on uh, particularly in relation to the um, the nature of the modifications that would be sought. I think they've moved quite substantially, but yeah, Mr it, Collins has been heavily involved. If, if I can add uh, some facts to that, I, I'm, it really has been in the last two weeks, maybe three, that we have worked, uh, Mr Merrick and I have worked with the unions. We were very key to ensure that we didn't get scope creep from the unions, and also they were very keen that they got what they thought were the, the necessary modifications, and uh, uh, we put together um, those in detail. I think we have a good position now and, uh, and both parties are satisfied with the outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, we are now working obviously on the, the need to examine further the mock-ups as uh, Mr Sharp talked about, the testing of the guard store uh, and one of the things as Mr Sharp talked about was that as if we get an agreement to move forward from Cabinet then we will quickly um, go to this testing regime and work with the unions further on training programs mm -hmm. uh, in the um, event of trying to ensure we get these trains into service as soon as possible. Um, so you said you, you've got a position now, and obviously you're working on the details and the mock-ups, and I understand how that works. But in yep. terms of that position, um, and in particular the position that was agreed in relation to the modifications, when was that agreed? When did you come to that position? What date? Mr Merritt might want to correct me, but I think it probably has been nailed in the last week, I think, probably, with Mr Devitt, who is works is our fleet uh, director on our side, and the unions, and we've had several long days of making sure we're absolutely accurate with uh, specialists on the union side and our own side as well, as well as our infrastructure and place partners. So. I think in the last week I'd say I'd be absolutely clear mm -hmm. where that document is. But of course, as Mr Sharp suggests, until we know where we are with Cabinet and, and either yep. neither the unions or ourselves will be in a position to say it's locked and loaded for okay. obvious reasons. But there were, there were, would it be fair to say there were intense negotiations going on in relation to the Marion um, modifications for the past 
how long? Three, well, three weeks? Dur during the six-week period, it obviously was one of the key issues the unions had raised with uh, the, the team. Mm -hmm. And what we uh, decided to do with the assistance of Mr Merrick was that we would get together a group of, a smaller group of specialists from mm. the union side and uh, specialists from our side, the project team who look after the Marion, and we'd literally sit down and I attended a number of meetings to ensure that we're making progress mm. and out of that came the, the agreement in principle. So, okay, so we have a six week process and from um, the documents we obtained um, under our call for papers um, from the upper house, um, it appears that there was a very structured um, uh, process during that six weeks. There seemed there was progress being made. Um, we had a separate working group for Marion. Um, that has all been progressing um, over the last, um, well, even up until um, just a week ago. What was the impact um, of Minister Tudor Hope's statement on the 12th that there would be no modifications? I think I've learned over many years that um, you always keep your uh, options open and also that we believe that the opportunity for uh, Cabinet to discuss what those options were uh, would be available. So we did continue with those options, just examining what uh, the outcome would be. Uh, obviously, it's up to government um, to make that final call uh, in terms of modifications, but as I think Mr. Sharp describes as bookends. You start with not doing anything and mm -hmm. you end up with um, uh, the alternative. I think it was right and proper to continue with those discussions. Uh, so we are absolutely clear of where we stood. Mr. Sharp, was it helpful or unhelpful for Mr. Tudor Hope to make that statement in the context of the negotiations you were having with the unions? Uh, in the context of the negotiations, uh, the relationship uh, had deepened quite substantially with the unions through that six weeks. Uh, so we were in a position where uh, when Mr. Uh, Minister Tudor Hope uh, said his personal view was that he wouldn't support, uh, that didn't stop the work. So uh, we continued to bargain uh, in good faith. Uh, we had considerable delegate meetings lined up that week. They continued. And as Mr. Collins said, we continued to work on the marriage. We had an in-principle agreement with the unions that we would uh, be presenting to Cabinet the options that we uh, would agree and uh, Cabinet would make a call on it. And that hasn't changed and that continued during that week. I think it's fair to say there was probably a day or two pause where everyone went, well, what does this mean? Mm. But the reality is uh, for transport, uh, we continue to work with the unions and we are putting those options up for Cabinet consideration. Thank you. Mr Graham. Great. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll turn uh, briefly to another matter. It wouldn't be estimates without asking about uh, Tolling. Uh, so I will ask you, Mr Sharp, for a, um, an update on the issue we've discussed previously, which is about the tolls review currently being undertaken by Treasury and by Transport. Um, so really I'd firstly like to just simply ask you for an update about the progress on that review and the timing of that review. Uh, yes, the uh, review is underway. Uh, New South Wales uh, Treasury uh, running that. Uh, transport yep. is providing input and we attend uh, the working group <coughs> meetings. And uh, as you're aware, it is actually identifying policy reforms in this space. Uh, the number of options uh, that could occur and also are uh, there relief uh, measures that could be considered. Uh, two objectives, uh, consistency in toll pricing. Uh, and it can be challenging at the moment. Uh, some of them are distance based, some of them are, are fixed price uh, and you've got multiple tolls the differing uh, sections of the roads. And then the question of uh, fair and equitable tolling pricing is the other uh, objective. So the teams have been working uh, towards uh, a paper and recommendations in regards to those objectives. Uh, fair to say uh, there are some recommendations that are currently uh, being put up uh, to ERC for consideration. Uh, not so much on the policy side, but certainly in regards to relief measures and uh, addressing some of the cost of living pressures that are clearly uh, out there for everyone. Uh, so where that project is at is uh, I would suspect still September, October would be my feel before um, the final recommendations come down in terms of the harder sort of policy related recommendations. Right. So it's still, still in process um, and there are uh, updates being provided to ERC uh, you know, in the next month.
Yeah, and I mean the Minister's been reasonably clear this morning. Those, um, as you've said, recommendations heading to ERC at the moment, potentially for uh, toll relief measures in the budget, um, that's really the interim step, is that correct? Correct. Yeah, but that what, that is the bigger question about dealing with the substantial policy issues you've flagged there won't be dealt with... Uh, until later in the year. Yeah, the, the working groups are still working. Uh, through on that. Uh, I haven't got a specific deadline uh, that I'm aware of, but uh, it will take, I suspect, another three or four months to really land uh, worked up and supported recommendations. Mm. Okay. And uh, I want to ask you about one option. Um, the Minister's clear again this morning, the option that the Premier had referred to distance-based charges is, is part of this review that's on the table. I think the Premier had made that clear. He was uh, looking at that option. I want to ask you about another uh, option to ask is this under consideration and that's the option of decentralising the city. Um, I took that as to talk about moving the jobs. I'll read you the um, report from today. Ward, who was promoted to the roads portfolio late last year, acknowledged the financial strain the city's toll system could have on Western Sydney motorists and said Decentralising the city to reduce the number of people forced to travel long distances could go some way in addressing that problem. Is that an option here in the policy options that Transport and Treasury are considering? Is this on the table uh, rather than change of the toll arrangements, actually major decentralisation moves? Uh I'm not aware of major decentralisation being on the table. However, all options are being looked at. Uh, I, I haven't uh, spoken to the Minister specifically about her comments, but uh, if I look at the Bradfield and the South West growth areas, uh, the inference is that you will have more jobs uh, in those areas. And uh, it does make sense from a, if you're looking at a future transport objective to actually have jobs closer to where people live. Uh, so the six cities concept where... Uh, you work within the city, but you have a 30-minute connection to, to other cities. At the moment, you still have large numbers of people uh, commuting, for example, on rail into the CBDs, uh, mm. not, notwithstanding some of that. So I, my, uh, my view is that uh, the forecast of where city growth occurs and where jobs arise uh, is an interesting policy uh, area. Uh, but uh, from my perspective, I'm not aware that that's specifically uh, an option that's been worked on. Uh, mm. And, uh, but as I said, that all options are on the table with that working group. Let it's put, not confined to a thank two you. or three. Yeah, let me put to you this specific question about that policy option, as I'm struggling to understand it. Mm. Um, look, it's a good, a good idea, uh, as you've outlined in the planning options, but uh, in the planning policies. But for motorists struggling with the cost of tolls now, for people paying six thousand dollars a year in tolls now, it's hard to see decentralisation as something that's really going to happen before 2060, before these contracts end. Is there any reason why motorists under pressure should think this would be a source of hope? I think if you're looking 40 years out, um, policies can be uh, short-term focused, but they can also uh, take a, a, a long-term approach. It, this infrastructure will be around for, for many, many decades. So I would assume some of the policy agendas will look at longer term elements as well as the here and now. Uh, and from my perspective, uh, post-COVID, we are actually looking at where, where are the travel patterns and uh, it is interesting because patronage on rail, for example, is still lower coming into the CBD, uh, but there's more uh, movement within the suburbs. Yeah. So uh, we are grappling with uh, what does the new post-COVID norm look like? Yeah. And uh, at the moment, uh, interestingly enough, uh, road traffic's up. Now we know yeah. some of that's confidence uh, in uh, post-COVID, people have, have uh, a lack of confidence in, in uh, mass uh, transit, and we're doing a lot to boost that confidence, but mm. that is impacting at the moment. As so we need to work those, through those, yep. those changes uh, to understand what the, uh, you know, the policy environment is going to be. be As you've looked at those post-COVID travel patterns, have you recalculated the benefit-cost ratio for the uh, Beaches Link project uh, to see whether it's required? Uh, as people's working and living arrangements have changed, the way they travel around the city. Has that been recalculated ahead of a, an investment decision? 
So the whole of government, uh, including uh, Treasury, have been looking at what does that new norm look like. Uh, and obviously, as part of the budget process, there will be assumptions, I'm sure, that will be included and underpin the, the current budget. Uh, from my perspective, uh, if you're talking Beaches Link, that's a specific uh, project. And uh, as you're aware, there's gateways that we uh, review, and those include the final business case that, that goes up. Uh, if we were looking at any substantial changes in the forecasts of patronage or or uh, road usage that would be updated as part of that yep. process. So, so uh, uh, that's so a, that that's a helpful would, answer. Would so it would trigger a review. My question is, has it triggered a review of the benefit consideration? Uh, from Transport's perspective, we're still uh, ascertaining what that new norm looks like. I think mm -hmm. uh, er everyone across New South Wales is actually looking at uh, what those uh, trends are telling us. Uh, are they short term? Are they long term? And what does it mean? My personal view, uh, and it's a personal view, is that the core pieces of infrastructure we're delivering are such that the congestion and the benefits uh, still hold up. You're, I'm uh, going to draw you back to the specific question, Mr Sharp. That's all helpful, but I think you're saying that as of today, uh, transport has not recalculated the benefit-cost ratio for the beaches. Not, not for the beaches, no. yeah, and, a, and, a, and a decision hasn't been made yes, on, uh, yeah. on that by Cabinet no, either. Understood. Um, can you confirm that, given the uh, recent inflation figures, that at least six Sydney toll roads on July the 1st will have their tolls increased by double, double the normal amount, that is, rather than going up 1% uh, per annum, uh, they'll go up uh, by more than double that, 2 or 2.1%? Uh, the, I'm, I'm aware that the toll prices on the Hills M2, M5, Southwest Eastern Distributor, Cross City Tunnel Lane Cove, will have uh, revised tolling prices on 1 April <coughs> based on their existing contracts. Mm -hmm. And, uh, more than and I'd, have to, I'd have to take on notice the specific percentage and how that applies on those particular, uh, on those particular uh, road pieces of infrastructure. So you're not disagreeing with the fact that it'll be more than double, but you'll take on notice? Uh, no, well, yeah, I don't, I don't know what that number is. Uh, it's, uh, I know it, it kicks in on 1 April, I just don't have the details provided in my notes, so I'll, I'll have to come okay. back to you on it. And in relation, just two final questions in relation to the toll review that I'll hand to my colleague. Um, will there be, one of the questions we've put to you before and you didn't rule it out, but it hasn't happened yet, will there be industry consultation as part of this toll review? Or will this just be Transport and Treasury in a room drawing up the options? Uh, I believe there will be. Uh, I would have thought any government policy uh, would entail consultation. Uh, at the moment, our role is to provide input into uh, the Treasury-led review. Uh, it would be a decision for government in terms of how they choose to consult and what the nature of those options are. Uh, I'm, I'm not privy to that. Well, the budget's on June 21, and, and to date that hasn't happened. Uh, will it happen before the budget? Uh, in, in respect to uh, uh, that process, I don't know. Uh, at the moment, we're... We've prepared some current input uh, that's uh, being tabled with Cabinet for, for their consideration. Uh, what comes out of that, I don't know. And finally, I, I will, the toll paying public, will the toll-paying public be consulted as part of this review? Uh, I, I would suspect that there's going to be a number of stakeholders needing to be consulted if you're talking a long-term policy change. Uh, the Minister... Uh, uh, Minister Ward today has, has been clearly indicating that there are, quite publicly, that there are... Uh, reviews underway. Uh, so uh, I, I'm suspecting there would be but Mr. some Sharp, opportunity. Some, the government may do that. I'm asking about your review, Treasury's review, transport and assistance. As part of that review, will the public be consulted? Uh, I would have to um, uh, talk to Treasury to find out what their approach is on that. Uh, at the moment, we're providing uh, modelling on uh, motor usage. What do we see the uh, the, the behavioural changes, if prices change, what do you see is, you know, flow on implications. Uh, that's the role that transport is playing. So in terms of the broader structure of that review, uh, I'd have to refer to Treasury on that one. Thank you. Um, I just want to go on to uh, a different area from my colleague who has a fascinating and detailed interest in tolling, as you might have detected. Um, the uh, CBD and South West Metro projects, um, essentially, will these projects be finished uh, in 2024 as planned? Uh, my understanding is that that's the case. Uh, they, they have been uh, 
working post-COVID uh, with all the contractors. Uh, as you're aware, uh, the project was closed down and uh, for a period. Uh, the timelines have been uh, renegotiated, but I believe they are still on track to, uh, to deliver the, the program. Okay, and so you don't envisage any delays at all through the, the testing and commissioning? And uh, this is a complex uh, mega yeah. project, uh, so I'd, ne I'd never say there won't be risk. Uh, but there is a, a, an expert team in the uh, Metro organisation that has uh, a, an independent board that provides a lot of advice as well. Uh, so there are good governance structures around the Metro uh, project, but it's not without risk. Okay. Uh, it's not. So, and, so there's uh, been no need at this point for you to flag with mm. the relevant ministers that there may that you have the possibility of a delay? You, there's been nothing to sort of trigger that conversation? Uh, we've updated uh, ERC on the status of Metro and uh, there are further contracts being let, and the timelines uh, have been advised to uh, Cabinet off the back of that as well. So yes, they've been kept abreast of it. And those timelines are the same as they have? Like we're we're, 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 we're not out. seeing any delay that would impact on being able to deliver uh, the Metro in, in the years that we've uh, indicated. Yep. Well, um, I'm surprised by that answer, uh, Mr Shutt. Why is Minister Elliott, I think this was on May the Third, um, saying that the government was confirming the government was now considering opening the line in stages, um, given the increase in construction costs. Well, Minister Elliott was quite public about that. Yes. Now you're saying no change, no delay. Which of those two things is true? The, uh, the Bankstown line in particular has uh, benefits in opening it. So if you've got a large portion of the project that's uh, completed, and then you're looking at uh, the final stages of it, which is that stage out to the airport, it does make sense to consider uh, opening that up. Um, so we're, we're actually actively looking at whether that, that staged opening is a sensible uh, way of actually delivering the infrastructure early to the public. But it won't be the whole end-to-end, -end, because clearly uh, the last stages would be um, uh, still being delivered. But there are, as I said, there, uh, this is a complex project that does contain risks, uh, but the update uh, recently following the, uh, the implications coming out of the COVID uh, project uh, repositioning, we're still looking at delivering in that 2024. Okay. Can I, I just want to go to the procurement of um, the rolling stock then for these projects? So there's the three really, but so for the CBD, CBD and South Coast Metro, uh, has the procurement process finalised? Do the rolling stock, it's all locked in and ready? I would, I'd have to take that on notice with the Metro team. So we don't have a rep, rep, okay. Metro representative here today. So uh, okay. some of this detail I'll have to take on notice. Sorry. Can you also do the same thing then for the Western uh, Airport Metro mm -hmm. and uh, the Parramatta Light Rail Stage 2? So this is for the rolling stock. Yeah, the, the rolling stock. Yep. yep, yep, for the rolling stock. Um, and I just want to know uh, if that rolling stock, what, <coughs> which ones or what portions are being constructed within New South Wales? Take that on notice. Yep, thank you. Um, and has there a final business case been, so, sorry, has the final business case for the uh, Parramatta Light Rail Stage 2 been in existence for, uh, since 2018, is that, is that correct? Uh, we've been refreshing uh, that business case and uh, uh, that business case will be presented to ERC for consideration. Uh, the business case is all but finalised but there are still some uh, forecast updates that we're, uh, we're wrapping up, but uh, no, that business case so has been refreshed. And so is that the totality of the refreshment exercise, is the, uh, the business forecast, or is there other elements that you need to...? Uh, we were also concerned, just given Parramatta uh, Rail 1, uh, there were a lot of utilities, uh, contamination sites, and we were wanting to ensure that we had further visibility of that. So uh, the budget for this year included $50 million, which was allocated for geotech works, and a lot of those works are underway, and that is actually informing uh, the actual costs that we need to put into that business case. And that refreshment exercise, have you, has that gone out to tender? That went through uh, normal tender processes some 12 months ago. Okay, and who was the successful? Uh, I'd have to take uh, that on notice. Oh. Um, I'm not sure which geotech firm uh, was successful on it. Okay, and does that refreshment exercise include looking at um, supporting domestic production and rolling stock? Uh, yes, it does. It does? There, there's an option in there for that. Okay, um, so there's an option, but do we... Of course, that doesn't mean it's going to be taken up, though, does it? Uh, well, with all uh, papers that we put up to Cabinet, uh, you put a range of options, and those, those options include some local uh, content. Uh, there's others where uh, you potentially just uh, leverage a, a current contract and, and, and buy a kit that you already uh, know and operate. 
So uh, those options are there for cabinet consideration, and uh, that'll be weighed up in the overall business case assessment. Uh, and does the um, transport for New South Wales process uh, process a, a cost? Sorry, do you post, possess a costing? Oh, that's right. Do you possess a costing for the potential extension of a heavy rail line from Leppington Station to the Nancy Bird um, Bolton Airport? Uh, the federal government um, allocated uh, some funds uh, for uh, a business case to be uh, developed, and uh, those funds. Uh, have been considered as part of the current budget process. Uh, typically, if the federal government has put those in, uh, that would be uh, certain. However, we've obviously had a federal election, uh, so we'll be just waiting for confirmation on which projects uh, are on and out of the uh, pre-election process. There was also a number of election uh, commitments. commitments made as well, and we'd be working through which of those uh, you know, can be taken up and what the budget implications are for the New South Wales government off the back of that. That's heavy rail. Does it also include potential of uh, extending the metro? Uh, the metro was uh, the uh, the Leffington money is actually the business case. Now the business case will look at what's the best rail options. So what is the best uh, rail option? Correct. And so that uh, that will form part of that business case. Okay. Um, and uh, okay, so that's the that's, that's that. Okay. Can I? So with regard to. Um, what, what, what's the difference, I guess, in construction costs between heavy rail and light rail? It, it, well, heavy rail and light rail. I mean, so there are some variables. I mean, there are. Yeah. yeah. But, 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 but the light rail, a rule of thumb. The light rail is, uh, I haven't got a rule of thumb, because it does vary on uh, where you're actually uh, running it, uh, whether the corridors are there. Yeah. Typically with light rail, uh, because you're going down uh, roads or creating a narrow corridor, uh, you're going through uh, brown field sites and so the contamination risks are quite high. Uh, for heavy rail, typically we've got long-term corridors, uh, they're quite wide, uh, you, you already have infrastructure uh, largely in place so it costs more for that infrastructure, however light rail has its complexities and depending on where you're actually building it, those costs can, uh, uh, can add up. But typically light rail is substantially cheaper than heavy rail. Okay, and just with regards just to... Just through gauge, sheer amounts of steel, um, you know, yes. the amount of infrastructure you put in underneath to support these. Yeah, and can you just um, maybe then, you, the rolling stock and looking at the domestic production of the rolling stock, but also domestic, domestic production of other materials, uh, is that included in the business case? Is that a part of the options that you would put forward to government? Uh, yes, it is, and uh, it is interesting when you look at it, there's actually quite a large amount of uh, domestic uh, manufacturing well, product the construction of these things is quite substantial. I mean, it is. Pearl, so, for, instance, uh, for example, the Sydney Light Rail project uh, so right. far has used 8,000 tonnes of steel, and that's 100% uh, Australian uh, steel that's been used. And likewise, uh, the North West Metro tunnels are 7,000 tonnes, and that was Australian sourced as well. Uh, so, there's quite a bit of Australian source material already uh, utilised in a lot of the major projects, including the rail. Okay. You might come back, Cosley. Thank you. Um, I'll just ask a couple of questions and I might hand back to the opposition. Um, I just wanted to ask about the um, the period where we had the fares um, basically being waived on um, city transport um, and it appeared to be a quite successful um, sort of period of getting more people onto, the, uh, onto public transport. Um, what is being... Um, sort of looked at in terms of maybe doing that again in the future? Uh, yes, and look, thanks for the question. It was a really interesting experiment in some ways. Uh, it was quite a large period of time uh, aligned with uh, holidays and uh, weekends. Uh, the initial uh, economic reports that I've seen uh, show that it was uh, a positive uh, contribution. So the fares that we, we would have uh, picked up at the time uh, were more than outweighed by economic benefits that flowed on. Uh, so. Having looked at that, uh, you certainly wouldn't be doing it in, in your peak uh, work periods. Uh, mm -hmm. The dollars uh, wouldn't work. But there may well be periods where this could be considered. Uh, as, as part of our fares review, uh, certainly uh, fare-free days is something uh, that's, a, that's an option that could be considered. Uh, it would need to be considered by Cabinet as part of a suite of uh, you know, fare uh, proposals. Uh, but it was actually an interesting uh, flow-on impact. 
Uh, now, it was around a heavy holiday period, so the revenue lost uh, was all less than what, what you would normally see, uh, but it also generated significant economic activity, particularly around the CBD. Um, when people were using transport, they still had to um, sort of tap on or tap off, didn't they? Um, is there, a, I guess, a scenario where um, that wouldn't be required either, where you could just keep all of the... Um, or, well, you, or do you do, are you doing that for data collection purposes? Yes, and there's other, other system issues, but I'll, I'll pass to Mr. Longer yeah. to talk to that. Thanks, Thanks for the follow-up, um, Secretary. It was a successful period, um, 12 days, so it operated from Easter Thursday through until Anzac Day. Um, the good weather and the fact that a lot of people were on holidays um, attracted many to use public transport that maybe hadn't used it for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, and it generated activity not just on the rail network, but also ferry uh, and light rail, which is very positive, and also the bus network. Uh, the requirement on Opal is really about allowing us to collect the data so mm -hmm. we can understand where services were at capacity and, and as the Secretary highlighted, being able to evaluate the success of uh, the trial to look at where did we increase patronage relative to a normal period and is, is the cost of foregone revenue, uh, does it outweigh or does the benefit outweigh the cost? Mm -hmm. um, are you able to tell me what the percentage... Hmm, I'm trying to, basically, I want to understand what the costs of our ticketing and fare infrastructure is based how much we... Um, take in as, as revenue from fares, um, what is the, I guess, the percentage of, of fare revenue um, that is effectively spent on the infrastructure, so on Opal, on um, the, um, I guess, the even when it comes to things like enforcement of, um, uh, you know, fines for people who haven't paid, do you have that sort of data? Uh, not handy, but we'll take that on notice. Uh, the Opal system is a legacy system. Uh, there are quite specific costs associated with uh, maintaining that. And uh, at some point, we'll need to look to actually move to uh, a new uh, revenue system. Uh, the costs of that are not just for collecting the dollars. Uh, a lot of this is actually around understanding the flow of uh, passengers. And it's actually quite critical in terms of understanding uh, exactly where capacity needs to be deployed and how you schedule. Uh, so that information data collecting is actually a really critical part of it. Uh, having said that, uh, the payment systems themselves are changing uh, globally, mm -hmm. and uh, if you do want to actually have fares, uh, then you need to utilise that technology. So uh, there will be a business case uh, that's presented uh, that will look at that. Now, the current Opal system has been in place for many, many years, uh, so the costs are actually uh, depreciated and spread. So if you're after an annual cost, it'll be going through the various uh, accounts that relate to that and pulling that information out. So I'd have to take that on notice. Mm. Um, so the OPAL system and the contract, I guess, that's in place with OPAL... Um, the company's called Cubic. Cubic, thank you. Does it allow... Um, do you have to, I guess, are you... How, how, what's the, um, the period of time that you're locked into that for? And does it allow for modifications to the system... Um, uh, it's, a, it's a legacy system, mm -hmm. very, very challenging to do modifications and mm -hmm. very, very expensive. So uh, even things like Fair Free Day was actually extraordinarily difficult for transport to deliver mm -hmm. uh, with a very old uh, system. Uh, Cubic are actually migrating all of their customers onto a new technology platform and the world has moved on substantially in this mm -hmm. space. Uh, so we're testing the market. We'll be going out to market uh, in the next year, mm -hmm. and uh, the reason for doing that is the contract uh, finishes in 2004, and uh, there are risks. 24, 24. Uh, 24 yeah. And, yeah. Sorry, 2024. <laughs> and uh, that uh, there's a risk in terms of how long you could even extend that for, just because of the technology changes. Mm. Uh, so we're very focused on that. That's a priority uh, review and priority project for us. Uh, and it has a lot more benefits than just collecting the fares. Um, mm. the, the new systems pretty much have a, a core grunt system, technical term for a big system that can handle big data, and then you plug in uh, customer-related um, uh, systems that, that allow easy uh, interface. And it could open up applications that are much easier to use on your phones, mm. uh, real-time information that, that could be useful for 
uh, for customers. So we're looking at what are all those other benefits that the new technologies bring, what's the cost of that, and uh, from my perspective, how much of that's off the shelf. Uh, I'm not big on uh, uh, developing things in your own right. Uh, there's a lot of smart technology companies out there, and that would be the approach we would adopt. Okay. I was going to say, because there is, obviously, the rest of the world is moving to, you know, a cardless system where people are using their smartphones or their, oh, sorry, their watches or their, you know, that sort of thing. Um, it seems like that's becoming rapidly yes, an and outdated. Yes, we, we did a trial. Uh, we had about 4,000 uh, people using, a, effectively, a digital card. Uh, mm -hmm. It was on their phones. Uh, about 70% uh, of those who used it uh, indicated they would prefer that as their mechanism in facing the transport. Uh, so that will certainly be one of the options. Uh, but having said that, uh, there are still quite large sections of the population that uh, uh, aren't tech savvy uh, or uh, haven't actually got the uh, credit cards to use. And I, I think uh, the younger generation in particular are just not using credit cards at all. So there are other uh, techniques that we would need to use. So I still think the old card may well still uh, exist, uh, but certainly mobile phones will be the lion's share of it in the future. You can see that trend happening. Mm. Thank you. I'll hand back to the opposition. Yeah, thank you. I just want to follow on a bit, from, if I could, on that. Um, I think, uh, i just get the words right here. Uh, I think you said, Mr Sharp, it would move to a new revenue system. Um, has that work, so has that work commenced? And can I gather from your responses to this board that that work has commenced? Uh, we're, we're commencing uh, the concept development. So we're starting to explore what uh, is in the marketplace. Uh, we're also starting to look at uh, what business case and direction we would like to see these, uh, these systems go. And uh, it has really been driven by that drop dead date of 24, 25. At some point around that period, you'll see the technology starting to become obsolete. And uh, so there is a, an absolute bookend in terms of uh, what we need to do. So that work has commenced. We're nowhere near a business case. Uh, we would go out to market uh, for expressions of interest and all of that work will be coming up in the coming months. So the current Opal system then, have we sort of pushed it to its limits? Have we sort of, you know, stretched yeah. and extended and it's, it's groaning and creaking as we speak? Is it <laughs> could be a fair assessment? It is. Okay. Um, it's, a, we... it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's an old programming system, so everything's hard-coded. So when you want to change something, you've actually got to go in and do enormous amounts of work and testing just to do a very simple change. Uh, it, it is a very, very old technology, and the whole uh, transport sector worldwide, globally, is moving on to new systems. Okay. So then, with regard to the fair free days, um, have we been? Have you been able to um, interrogate the data that was collected via the tap on tap off process? For I guess what I'm after is um, each day the usage on the buses, the light rail. Oh, we have that data. You, we have that data. you yeah. Yeah. provide that on notice to us. Just we, the break we in certainly between. can, uh, Mr. Vetch, um, Obviously, what we did see was um, a huge uptake of light rail and ferries. As we saw, there was they were very popular, um, and I certainly visited a number of sites, and that was good to see. Would that be um, because of the school holiday period? I think it's the you know families, particularly from Western Sydney, were out you know enjoying the fact that they could take the whole family for free, which is great because otherwise it would cost you quite a lot of money. Um, and I certainly did believe that, as Mr. Sharp said, it wasn't so much you know the the, the loss in revenue, it was the generation of all those ice cream sellers, shops and everything else which you know I saw being very busy, yep. um, just like you know we're seeing with Vivid uh, in the last few days. Yep, and did you, did, so how does this work, did you get Treasury supplementation uh, for the fair free days or have you had to absorb that within your own, your own budgets? I remember discussing it. Um, <laughs> with Treasury yeah. or with, or <laughs> with, with Treasury? Treasury. Uh, we tend uh, not to absorb anything these days because it's uh, very challenging for, for us to do so. I think on that occasion we may, I'll have to come back and you, confirm yeah. specifically. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting because the fare box, forecasting the fare box has been extraordinarily difficult uh, coming out of COVID. And uh, that, that has been uh, one of the challenges in managing uh, the transport budget for this year. Now we've successfully done that and we've had to manage our costs quite, uh, quite tightly. But ultimately, uh, that specific question, yeah. I'll have to find out where that'd, I'm that'd be good. I think you also took a notice of uh, the uh, breakdown, I think it was Mr Collins, by, by system type. Is it possible by day, by day each day? Um, we, we certainly have uh, looked at that. We used to pour over that daily to see how many people were travelling on the particular day, but we certainly provide that. And just to give you an indication, in 2018-19, $1.35 billion was taken in fair revenue. 
um, it reduced in 2020 to 1.6, uh, 1.26 billion. So it's it's not small change, but they're again making these changes for a period of time did encourage uh, the recovery of the economy, and certainly we can provide you that information regarding. Yes, so by, by by day and by type, if that's possible, that'd be that'd be good. Yep. Thank you. I just want to go on now, if I could, uh, to the. Um, I noticed last week there was a departmental review announced at the Emerald Class Two Manly Ferries because of continuing performance issues uh, with the, the vessels. So, just some questions about this review. So, has the review commenced yet? Uh, the Gold Pass is to Mr. Collins, who lives in. Thank you. I live in breathe Emerald Class, and I get daily feedback from my colleague Mr. Longland, who often travels on them from Manly. Um, I would start off by saying. Um, as a vessel, uh, certainly our customers like them because they do the journey in less than 20 minutes um, uh, compared with uh, longer journeys on the freshwater. But it has been frustrating that uh, the Emerald Class 2s, because we've got 1s as well, uh, have a lot of what I call small but niggling issues, which we've seen over the last few few. Uh, months. Did you call them teething issues? Um, I would say so, and, and I, I, I like reading history, and there were history about the freshwaters having teething issues and coming Jarrah around Jarrah. and all sorts of, yeah. if you remember. Um, um, I, I do think, though, we have been, as you talked about, answer your question directly, we have been engaging uh, with the contractor who's responsible for the franchise and the, the operation of these ferries. Um, we have been talking to them and have had taken a number of contractual um, actions to ensure that performance improves. This is not just about the, um, the Emerald Twos, but we also have been working with the original Australian designer. Uh, we, we use them very effectively to help us understand how the vessels operate under swell, and also they provided some additional training for, for staff. Um, there are good ferry. They're, they're actually a global product. You, you, if you went to New York, you'd see some brand new, similar design ferries designed in Australia, uh, operating in New York. Um, but it has been frustrating. Steering solenoids, uh, small cracks in in the diesel tanks, a number of other issues. Um, some of them we address very quickly. In fact, today I think uh, we've got two out of three, and the other one in heavy service should be back out with us very Mr. soon. So are these all going to be a part of the review, all these issues? Uh, the, the whole, what we are doing, um, uh, as one would do if we felt that a particular contract wasn't performing well, we have over the last year had a whole series of meetings with, with our contractor and, and they've made some improvements. It's great to see that we've got eight out of the ten river class with modified um, wheelhouses out there now, which is good to see. But um, in terms of staffing issues, performance of, of the, the, the new ferries and a number of other areas, uh, we are, and, and certainly my team is leading an intensive review to ensure that we can get the contractor back on, on the performance that we look So the review is an in-house review? Absolutely. We, we have uh, good capability now, and uh, certainly in my time in the two years I've been COO, been sure that we bring in. Uh, some expertise within this area, um, you know, people who run ports, understand ferries, um, and are more, uh, less of a general bureaucrat and more of a focus con contract manager, and that certainly has, uh, has tightened, uh, I think, the relationship and made sure we, we focus on what needs to be done. We all want to, on behalf of the customer, see uh, an improved service, and we want to see um, ferries operating every day and little or at all, at all cancellations. Safely. Can, so, so the review, so the, the review is currently underway. Is there a time frame? Uh, we're working with the uh, contractors on a number of areas. Some are uh, have time scales, contractual time scales, uh, to return the information, and others are actually on our our. Um, our radar for the next you know couple of months we have given the the opportunity for the the franchise operator to come back to us on a number of uh, things that we want to see improvements on okay and so um, again, the constitution of the review just it's in house but so is it, is it worth you a set of terms of reference or is there a a sort of a frame. What, what's the framework for the reviews? Well, we through? clearly spell out under the contract the areas that they are failing to deliver, and there are a number of KPIs that they have not delivered, and we have uh, issued them with a number of 
directions and framework which actually allows us to say these are the things we wish for you to improve upon and we will regularly come back to that. And there are various uh, types of uh, contractual powers we have um, to ensure that uh, the contractor comes back to that. Um, it is good to see that they, I think, have, uh, have uh, come to the table and there we have, and I know Mr Sharp and I have spoken to the global managing director of, of the organisation and we are seeing a much higher level of uh, input and support from uh, this organisation and I hope the outcome is that we will see a better performance from this organisation. So the review has been initiated because of a clause within the, the contract? I, I, the... I think the review has been initiated because um, that over several months we have seen a deterioration of the performance uh, that you know the media grabbing um, you know failures of, of the ferries but also the fact that we do believe that uh, we want to see those KPIs achieved yep. and uh, we have been doing that and using the the full weight of the contract but also some good intensive discussions with the uh, franchised operator. Are there financial penalties, you don't have to tell me how much, but are there financial penalties built into the contract? Absolutely and that's so. one of the important things to recognise that uh, apart from reputational penalties, it is there are financial ones which we apply. And so how are they how are those financial penalties initiated? Is it what would that arise from the review? Or have you already imposed or they arrive through the contract through uh, targets or KPIs, key performance indicators being met or not met. Um, and we have other methods within the contract of applying or giving notice to the con to the contractor of how they need to improve their performance. So have you already levied some? We have applied a number of those. Okay. And has, is there a, a process then for the contractor to, um, uh, I guess, challenge or refute? Is there an appeal process built into this exercise? Yeah, as, as most people around the table would understand, there is obviously a, a contractual process of, of coming back and asking questions or challenging our premise of, of, the, of the contract KPIs not being uh, completed. You know, a lot of uh, issues, as we know, regarding COVID or force majeure, but we're pretty clear that we think uh, we can do better with for our customers here and we are holding them to account. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, was there a time? I can't remember whether you answered that. I, I, the, okay. Some of these things have time scales. Um, and others will roll forward. Others will roll forward. Um, yep. What I'm looking for in the next two months is... Uh, a marked improvement of the performance of the fleet and also a marked improvement of the performance of the staffing levels which allow us to operate all the services. We recognise the impacts of COVID, we recognise the impact even of the current flu epidemic or pandemic or whatever you like to call it, but certainly the flu uh, rise in the last few weeks. But we do believe that more planning and more work can be done. And Mr Collins, when you say you want to see that improvement, which KPIs are you particularly concerned about? Where well, do you want with, to see that improvement? Without going into detail, there are a whole range of KPIs, but they're the ones which measure things like uh, cancellations of service, the ones which measure customer satisfaction, although that still seems to be pretty high, as everyone loves travelling on our Sydney ferries. It's a, probably one of the greatest experiences of commuting in the world, if you're on a ferry when the sun's shining. But I do think... Um, there are a whole series, uh, Mr Graham. Of, but I'm of asking, which are you most concerned about? I, I think it is those about. cancellations of services and uh, delays of service, either non-availability of fleet or non-availability of staff. Thank you. Yeah. And can I, um, this report or the review process, will there be a report generated for internally that goes... That, like all contract um, discussions, there will be obviously documentation provided yeah, if, if I describe, I know others have talked about it as being a sort of report, um, it's an internal review, uh, it is something that I've called for and my contracts team have, have uh, put together um, and obviously following those discussions we will uh, make sure that uh, the actions the contractor uh, is going to make we agree with, uh, we've got timescales and the rectification of, of, of those issues. Uh, will come forward and we'll monitor that closely through the contract. Okay, and you're bringing in external, did you say bringing some... The, the um, no, uh, what I said earlier, just to clarify, is that uh, over the last two years we've recruited into various oh, senior yes. contract positions um, uh, for 
uh, contractors, um, but also in, in their own team. So I've strengthened that, and we're looking further to strengthen that team uh, on all these franchise contracts. Okay, and um, with regard, so was so this the, the review? Will there also be consultations? For instance, you're going to be talking to the union uh, or users. You talked about the satisfaction mm -hmm. level of the the, the customers, mm -hmm. the the users of the ferry service. Uh, this internal review, just how extensive are you going to reach out to gauge? Well, we're, we're not reaching out to external parties as such. You know, the customer satisfaction scores come in on a reasonable, you know, uh, normal basis for all yeah. modes. Um, I think the latest one is, is soon to be underway. Um, we understand that obviously the role and responsibility of the, the franchise operator is to, to speak to the unions. Um, but as Mr. Sharp knows, that we often engage at a senior level, at the, at the senior secretary level, with trade unions, and um, you know we have conversations with all uh, of those unions, including the ferry operators. And so, with regard to the, the serious and systemic issues that have sort of arisen with these vessels, can you just talk us through, Mr. Collins, what are the interim steps you've put in place to ensure that uh, customers have a, a safe and reliable service? Yes, well, well um, starting from the very basics of daily conversations with my um, management team of, of uh, what vessels are available, what is the staffing situation, uh, a real hands-on approach to understand where we are, but then a whole series of meetings uh, which we have organised to understand the weekly progress of rectification of faults, uh, the bringing into service of the final river classes, and the final modification of a number of things that this operator is uh, due to do. So it's a, it's a whole series of process from daily understanding and I can tell you because I text out to various people every morning the state of play for all modes uh, but also um, the weekly progress and understanding things like uh, the management of uh, their staffing levels, the repair program or the fixed program for their fleet. Okay. Can I just one last question before I hand over to uh, my colleague? Um, so the KPIs, are you able to provide on notice just what the KPIs I, are? I would say I will provide what I can, but obviously you understand that many of these are commercial in confidence and negotiated uh, with the contractor, but I'll take that on notice and if I can provide some indication of, uh, but they are the very um, straightforward measures, on -time running, cancellation, it's a bit like uh, the performance data that Matt is held accountable for and others. Uh, it is about what the customer feels and sees, which is, is the ferry there, is it on time, um, and am I going to get to my destination? So any cancellation or late running is recorded as a KPI. Okay, thank you. Uh, I might just cover some of the ground we've just covered then, just to tidy up um, a few of those issues. Firstly, thank you for your answers relating to the um, OPAL system. Uh, in relation to the cost of recoding for the Fair Free Days, um, was there a cost uh, and was that something where we actually had to pay uh, Cubic in uh, order to make that? My, my understanding is no. Uh, we were able to use uh, the system parameters to actually uh, provide that. So I think on that occasion, though, uh, if you're looking at uh, some new fare type or yeah. you know, let, let's do a particular discount on yeah. an off-peak, that type of thing uh, is quite expensive and yeah. very challenging to do. But no, I'm not aware of it. I'll take, take it on notice, but I don't thank think you. there was a, a direct cost. And then in, thank you for that answer. And then in relation to the data about the 12 days of fare-free travel, can I just um, be uh, more specific again as to what we were requesting? So. I think we've you've agreed to provide that by day um, and, by service. and by mode, yep. I think is probably the best way to describe yep. it. But I think the other uh, thing that would be really helpful is um, to understand how much this was able to boost transport into the CBD. I think particularly given all the discussion about the mm. um, fate of the CBD at the moment, uh, if you could distinguish between activity in the CBD and outside of the... CBD, that would also be helpful. Yeah, th thanks for that question. Uh, we'll do what we um, can. Um, it, that's quite complex. Um, yeah. I'll see what is available. Yeah. Uh, unlike other systems which have a zonal system, right. this is on a end-to-end -end trip data, but 
I can assure you, Mr. Graham, if you were in the air at the time, it did feel like the CBD was very, very busy and that people had made journeys which they don't normally make. It was also good to see that people had made trips to the Blue Mountain, to the Central Coast um, during that, that period of time. So I'll leave it in your hands as to the way you're yep. able to distinguish that, but I think it's a reasonable question to um, ask you to tell us what you can tell us about yep. how much of that was in the Blue Mountains, how much of it was in the, in the city. Thank you. So on, on notice. Um, and again on notice, uh, Mr Sharp, you've taken on notice the question about uh, discussions with Treasury and whether you, there was supplementation or perhaps uh, not in this instance. And if there was, could you take on notice the quantum of that as well? Um, and I think you're nodding for the answer. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, then I just want to return to that question about the um, uh, Metro Rail, the uh, uh, South West Metro Rail, and this discussion about where Minister Elliott saying, look, uh, we may need to uh, stage the delivery of this uh, rail. Given the, I mean, the government's been very upfront about the cost pressures on construction mm. in general, this might lead to staging um, and, and rolling out this metro rail line in two stages. That's been the view the government's put. But you're today, I think, and this is why I want to come back to it, putting evidence that even if this is broken into two stages, it won't mean delay. Uh, of the delivery, even of that Western... Uh, My well, understanding is that, that it will still deliver in 2024, and uh, uh, if there's a specific uh, detail you need, I'll need mm. to take it on notice and go back to the Metro team, but uh, my understanding is it's still delivering in 2024. Yeah. Uh, the last stage, which is the complex stage, is that, that bit out of the airport. We could get the rest of the Metro up to Bankstown up and running, and that could actually open up, a, you know, obviously, a lot earlier. Mm. Uh, which would be beneficial to the public. Yeah. So, uh, but in terms of uh, the latest you know, uh, details, I'd have to take that on notice with Metro specifically. Right. So if you take that specific date on notice, but I think you're saying, even if this is staged, the entire project will be uh, up and running by 2024. That's my understanding, correct. And testing was to begin next year in 2023 across this entire... Uh, yeah, so early uh, 2023, time. correct. And uh, it is one of the considerations with the ongoing industrial... Uh, action because clearly accessing uh, rail to actually get rolling stock on to test the systems uh, is uh, is problematic. Uh, some of the dust relation uh, flow-on consequences was lack of uh, possessions uh, where Metro was unable to actually get access. So uh, some of those pressures uh, tie in with uh, the outcomes of the mm. industrial relations uh, negotiations that are occurring at the moment. Mm. This project was originally supposed to cost $12 billion. Now the speculation is it's $17 billion. What can you tell us about the cost of this project? Uh, my understanding is that the government will make uh, uh, comments publicly around cost of projects when the uh, contracts are finalised, and I believe uh, uh, in the next six months the final contracts are let, and I presume around uh, those stages costs would be uh, advised. Uh, clearly there is a cost up uh, off the back of COVID, and uh, we've been quite public about that. Uh, so uh, I can't advise a, a, a number here uh, because it needs to be uh, something that the government would uh, would talk to specifically. Well, look, we're weeks away from the budget. Will there be an update on this cost in the budget? Um, will we have some idea of what the increasing cost will be for this project? Yeah, look, I, that, that's a question for Treasury in terms of what they put in the budget and uh, well, these, I'm not able to comment on that. These figures are provided by Transport, Mr Sharp. I hope you'd be able we, to we be provide, more specific. We provide... Uh, on a regular basis, uh, numbers through to Infrastructure New South Wales, who provides advice to the government. And we also provide regular costings through to uh, Treasury, who uh, are obviously across this. It's more a question of uh, when uh, and how it fits into the budget and what, what they disclose at that point. So it's a question for government in terms of uh, the timing. I might ask you just more generally now, rather than this specific project mm. about the budget. The government's been quite clear, Minister Stokes in particular, but now Minister Ward this morning, uh, there will be delays to um, transport projects in the budget. I might just put to you, um, uh, I'll just see if I can... Uh, yeah, Minister Ward's quite up front uh, about that fact in the, in the paper today. What can you tell us about the cost pressures that transport is facing um, that with construction, uh, that you're trying to deal with as you grapple mm. with these questions? Uh, 
two uh, uh, two prongs to answering that. Uh, in terms of cost pressures, uh, yes, we're not immune to it. Uh, we do have uh, good contractual relationships uh, with our suppliers, and a lot of those uh, are in place and do provide some coverage. Uh, we have had cost pressures from COVID, and we've been negotiating uh, the cost settlements uh, as we speak on those. Uh, in terms of broader uh, contracts, I think you'll see the industry moving forward on things like steel, which uh, continues to increase. You'll see uh, commercial uh, negotiations where there'll be a, a joint risk taken on some of those commodity items, perhaps referencing indexes. I can see uh, procurement uh, uh, processes changing, so there's a balance of risk across the industry. Uh, having said that, uh, the second prong to this is around, rather than delays, it's actually around prioritisation of projects. So, uh, there's a peak of projects that are occurring right across Australia. Uh, that is putting pressure on uh, resourcing. A lot of industry has been flagging uh, resource constraints and uh, the construction industry hasn't been immune to that. Uh, there's ways and means to help manage it. Uh, we are tending to break down our packages more and uh, we're seeing the Tier 1 companies in particular uh, being closer to their limits in terms of capacity. But the Tier 3s are smaller in the town. There's definitely capability and how we can package can actually make a difference to tapping into that. It also um, provides the growth vehicle for uh, competition to those largely international mm. companies that are coming in at the tier one level. Mm. So there are things, practical things we're doing, but coming back to the Minister's comment, um, in fact the Premier has made the same comment, uh, there, there is a review underway across whole of government in terms of prioritisation of projects. Uh, that is still a live conversation and, uh, and will we'll ultimately uh, settled during the budget process. So I would expect to have visibility around the end of June um, as, a, as a cluster in terms of where that lands. But uh, we're still presenting to ERC on those types of projects, what, what implications are uh, and of new projects, particularly Commonwealth funded ones, which ones uh, dovetail in. It is interesting. Uh, the industry tells us having a secure pipeline of work enables them to manage their resourcing and so they can actually manage more work. And there are inefficiencies. So we're working closely with industry to address I, I those. Might, I, I might take you to this question. What discussions have you had with your interstate colleagues about that sequencing, given your posi the position you're putting here? Is that There's a, a uh, cabinet the um, infrastructure committee uh, that was uh, put in place uh, about four or five months ago. Uh, we've had a number of experts from interstate, uh, including following the Victorian budget, where they... Uh, highlighted um, overspends, uh, quite significant overspends on projects uh, where they'd run into significant project challenges, but also uh, they were spreading the peak over the, over two or three years. Uh, so we've actually had those experts come in and present to us and give us the background to their thinking and what they're seeing in the market. I've also personally spoken to um, the Secretary, uh, my counterpart in Queensland on a number of occasions, and there's also a, uh, a Commonwealth forum uh, where the secretaries get together. So there's a number of mechanisms that we actually tap into information to assist in this decision making. And finally, I might just ask before I hand to my colleague, when you say that um, this won't mean delays, but you talk about prioritisation or smoothing the peak, I mean, to me that sounds like exactly that. You, uh, on the government's... Uh, if, if you're talking... Then up front, there will be delays. If, if you're talking a new project that hasn't, uh, that hasn't actually been approved or... Uh, funded at this point, yes. then uh, it, it's, it, from my perspective as a transport lead, it's not actually a project on my book, so yes. therefore it's actually not a delay. Yes. Um, it may well be from an election commitment or it may well be from an announcement perspective, yes. uh, and yes. that's, that's up to the government. So to, that's uh, the distinction to you're drawing. So mm -hmm. to take a specific yes. example, the one we talked about Correct. earlier, Order. the northern so beaches. We are out of time, um, so make it very quick. The it's northern beaches <laughs> link is one such... Yes, that would be an example. Sorry. Sorry about that. You were mid-question, but I didn't know if you'd heard the bell. Um, it does bring our um, session to an end. Um, sorry, let me just check. No, 12 o'clock. I will just check that the government members have no questions. No. Um, Where's this not going to ask about their political affiliations? Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I do appreciate your time. I'm sure that all of the committee um, appreciates your time. Uh, that does conclude budget estimates um, for 2021-22, finally. Um, thank you very much to the committee team and Hansard as always. 
Um, if there are uh, any supplementary questions, the committee team will be in touch with you. Thank you very much.